I do not like the men on this spaceship. They are uncouth and fail to appreciate my better qualities. I have something of value to contribute to this mission if they would only recognize it. Today over lunch, I tried to improve morale and build a sense of camaraderie among the men by holding a humorous round-robin discussion of the early days of the mission. My overtures were brutally rejected. These men do not want a happy ship. They are deeply sick and try to compensate by making me feel miserable. Last week was my birthday. Nobody even said happy birthday to me. Someday this podcast will be played and then they'll feel sorry. <laughs> it was too good an option not to do oh, because so of good. how podcast well... for tape. Right. Right. Yeah, right. Perfect. But, but I just want to share the other one I wanted to do. Which, uh, uh, David, uh, fuck, where was it? You would have had to give me the alternate lines here. Uh, but the other one I wanted to do was, what are you going to name it? What? The new star. What are you going to name it? Who cares? Don't bother me. <laughs> Who cares? Don't I was, bother I was, me. Right, the new right. podcast. <laughs> yes. Because that is the first question right off the bat. I want to get into this right off the bat because David and I are texting about it. But Ben and our guests have not been part of this conversation. I'm a little bit curious to hear their opinion. This is a podcast called Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. And it's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce, baby. True. And this is a new mini series on the films of John Carpenter. And David texted me about two hours ago and said, what are we going to call it? What are we going to call this? This baby just got born. What are we going to call it? He said, what are we going to call it? And I didn't say I don't care. I gave him two options. And David seems to have a preference, but I'm curious to hear. I don't have a strong preference and I need to hear them out, said out loud. And you guys can figure it out, too. Okay. Yes, we can all figure this out. May, okay. may I? May I share an idea I'm having? Please. How do we feel about the podcast? <laughs> How about add one letter? They podcast. Oh, oh, oh. They, they, they podcast is actually funny. Actually, that's <laughs> yeah. pretty good. Okay. That's so pretty great, good. I feel like this is the thing with you, with you and I. Uh huh. You love to just to just strangle it into the most ridiculous, awful sounding. I want to be slammed, like pod and cast big into something that, right and little right cast. I, well, well. <laughs> I think I have just a off better the dome here. I don't know. I'm just spitballing. I think um, I have a better angle on the same structure. But uh, yes, I I I like a, a Louis Armstrong title where you're you're having to dab the forehead, <laughs> you're out of breath. Yeah. So you proposed to me two options. Say them out loud now. Okay. Option number one, and we'll let's just say we're officially adding they podcast as option number three. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Option number one. Podscape from Newcast. <laughs> Which is the first one you proposed to me with right. confidence. Yep. Where you're I like, just, I mean, this is I what think I think. I got it. I didn't buffer it. And you just said, wow. Your response was wow. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. sounds positive to me. But my second, my second, which I'm a little partial to, my second pitch, Pod Trouble and Little Cast. Hey. Pod, trouble, and little cast. Emily doesn't like it. Emily looks disgusted. Ben looked a little charmed. Hey. I uh, I honestly feel like syllables are the key to this thing. Mm. And you I don't think like turning China into cast. Is that what you're saying? Like turning two syllables into one? I think it's like big trouble and little podcast. I know that's not as spicy. <laughs> it's yeah. well, that's the thing. It's not that's the thing. Whereas I don't mind a podcast away. I don't mind a clean sounding. You just, you know, you got the word podcast in there. That's fine. So, like, if you told me in the podcast of madness uh, or whatever, you know, like, I'd be like, there's something thematic there. They podcast. That's pretty funny. The two times we have covered a filmmaker who has a movie title with cast in it. I right. have let you win. I've let you come up with right. podcast news and podcast away for the cleaner, the cleaner option. Uh, I wanted to do the, what pod to the future cast or fucking whatever, <laughs> but future cast. future cast, you know, a future cast. I think I'm just kind of into pod trouble. I think pod trouble is funny. I mean, we've all been in it before. We've all we been have. in pod Ugh. trouble. Do we think it feels like maybe 
Podscape from Newcast is the consensus option. Oh, yeah. That sounds like that's the consensus option. It sounds like Wait, everybody no. loves it. Po- Podscape. Podscape from Newcast. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's terrible because Newcast? <laughs> I'm like mopping up the floor right now. Like, I'm. Pod Salt! On cast no. sync thirteen. No, 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 no. no. Get that out of here, Griffin. Dikembe. <laughs> no, no, Dikembe. <laughs> Get that out of here. You're Dikembe. You give me the wagon finger. I just blocked that into the fifth row. That's not allowed. Let's percolate, and we'll know by the end of the episode. They podcast takes it. They podcast is pretty. I don't know. I hate to like give like I'm no one biased and I came up with it, but I do think it's the best idea. I mean, I'm going to suggest the dangerous thing. <laughs> the poll? Should we do the Twitter poll and see at the end of the episode where don't it stands? Do We've Twitter already poll. learned our lesson. We're no, not doing no a Twitter, Twitter poll. No more I, Twitter I, polls. I, I wait, wait, Twitter's that. good. Twitter's good. What's the problem? Here? Also, I'm not on Twitter anymore, so I won't be able to participate. I will only be able to like run a shadow campaign which I'm starting right now, to be clear. I was telling Emily before we recorded how much good sh- shit she's been missing on Twitter. Yeah, all, all, oh, all yeah. the Sounds fun. Sounds cool. Sounds chill and very, um, like, understandable. Like, like logical. Emotion- like, I can follow the emotional through line really even well. Even keel. Um, very even keel. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, our guest today is, of course, the mother of blankies herself, Emily Yoshida. Oh my God. Hello, my little babies. <laughs> and, and there are two big things I need to set up. Emily's coming in hot today. Emily's got it's like... Not, it's, well, now it's 10 in the morning. I was going to say it's nine in the morning, but uh, some time passed. Um, but I mean, not to, not to you know, I, I don't know if we're trying to like keep this under wraps, but I am actually in person here in I was my Hollywood Hills yeah. manse yeah. Uh, with... The pro doer himself. Yes. Ben Hosley. Hello. Producer Ben. So ben that's, if, if I sound a little bit like charged or like there's elect, an electric energy over here in L.A., it's it's for that reason. Chronologically, other episodes will have come out at this point. Chronologically, this is the first time one of us has been in the same room with anyone else for a record. Yeah. Yes. And it's... um. It, we've had an eventful morning. We've had an eventful <laughs> morning. We've discovered the whole like thing of like, well, actually, when you record by yourself at home, it's just like you just turn it on and go. Sure. Whereas like having multiple people in a room, it's complicated and things come up and you need adapters and wires and whatnot. But we made it. And luckily, I, I invested in like an audio studio's worth of like XLRs and adapters and stuff here uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's like, I guess I'm just doing this for the rest of time. But uh, we should also mention just to explain energy at play that Emily had a near death experience making coffee this morning. <laughs> I texted Ben, who's like, I'm going to come at 850 in the morning. I was like, oh, God damn. OK, uh, I guess I'll make coffee, smiley face. And then I like proceeded to have a I, I was telling that it, uh, Gr- Griffin David, like I was having a uh, who framed Roger Rabbit esque experience in the kitchen this morning involving scalding water and broken pots and uh, cleavers narrowly missing you forming an outline of your body against the wall. You got locked you. in the fridge at one yeah. point. Right. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So I'm ba- baby's you know. crawling on a hot stove top. <laughs> My baby. Um, yeah. So I'm the adrenaline is running high over here. Uh, and then I was running extremely late. You know, uh, I'm already really living up to that L.A. sort of life of just like being uh, delayed because of traffic. You know, the traffic. I mean, oh, boy, don't get me started. We were on the um, I don't remember the name of the road, but you're you probably know. on the 134. That sounds right. Okay. Terrible traffic. Oh, man. God. Uh, and just just wanted to say my Uber driver. Scary. Y- yes. Sounds uh, scary driver. You described him uh, and how you felt like he was putting your life at risk. And I asked you if he was a Toretto. Now, I want to. Right off the bat, because of this, say two things, and then we will get into the meat of this episode. John Carpenter's debut film, Dark Star. But one, Ben, you come onto this Zoom, not from in Emily's house, but in Emily's driveway wearing sunglasses. Yes. Clear blue California <laughs> sky phone. behind you. On your phone, just going like, hey guys, what's up? 
I think it is Going, time hey to... Hey, guys, what's up? And then also being like, hey, Emily, do I have to do something to the door to get in? Like, <laughs> making weird, like, convo. <laughs> it was really... And then I came out with my laptop already logged into the Zoom. And then we had double double Ben on the feed. Double screens. Look. The, the, it was really point. a Dark Star-esque finagle. And of... then Ben ended the whole <laughs> meeting. Yeah. <laughs> closed the whole Zoom. Yeah. And transmission. None of us remember how to be in the same room as another no, person. Absolutely not. We've all forgotten. Yes. But I just want to say, I do think this occasion it calls for, because this trip really seems to have been transformative for Ben, uh, a new nickname. I think he is perhaps now Hoslywood. Ooh. <laughs> ben Hoslywood. Like okay. I'm into that. But this is yeah. the other order of business. I want to get off right off the bat before we dig into Carpenter. Ben has, of course, graduated to a series of different titles across the course of different miniseries. Wait, no. Wait. I'm not, what? No. I'm not doing the full... I'm not doing the full list. I'm not doing the full... I didn't do all the fucking nicknames, but it is just a fact. It is a fact. It must be acknowledged that he has graduated to certain titles over the course of different miniseries, such as Obi Ben Kenobi, uh, Ben Night Shyamalan, Ben Say, Say Ben Anything, well, dot, dot, dot. I'll take this opportunity to say... Uh, Ailey Ben's with a dollar home. sign. Yeah. Oh, um, thank you. I really... Uh, Again, we kind of rushed into this. No, sorry, continue. I was no, just I'm struggling check. to remember I, Warhaws. Okay, sure. Uh, but yeah, I didn't check really get the wiki. The, <laughs> check the wiki. Yeah. Check M- the Mr. Wiki, yeah. Ben Credible, um, Eat Drink Ben Hosley, really, Ben Nineteen, the Fennel like, Maker. Uh, lovely home. I and, wish I could uh, show you the kitchen. Unfortunately, Banglish. it's in a bit of a state of disarray right now. But you forgot a um, uh, or Bane. Purdue okay. or Bane. But, Robo we're, Haas, we're really down. Robo uh, Haas, now. Yeah, the uh, vape are just juice. struggling. Beetle vape juice. What was the Nancy Myers one? The Hosliday. The Hosliday. God, and the thing is, is it's still public going. enemies. Yeah. Public I enemies, of course. I like, Osaka, I like by the Ditch of the Jersey. <laughs> right. I like the idea that instead of me having gone Hollywood, as was, ben. you know, a big uh-huh. like, through Hosling line of the last, city. the beginning of pandemic last year. Really? That's what I've gone said? Hosliwood, okay. honestly. I, don't I feel know. more comfortable uh, having gone Hosliwood. Than having ben Hosley met Sally. Yeah, that was good. Uh, the Secret well, Life of Ben. I mean, I've been doing okay, pretty good. I've obvious. had some really yeah. good God, food. This, people are going to love detective. listening to this. Funny. This is, yeah, this is one worry. Thing. I'll bring down the nickname part way in the Oh, okay. okay I we're going to mix. I we're going to mix the shit out. Of oh this. yeah, no. The people I, like people can <laughs> if they want. Well, they'll have a separate cut where they can we hear just right. that. Guys, uh, I, I'm going to be honest. I my brain is starting to break. I can't do all this stuff. <laughs> it's great. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. Did we ever come up with a lane? We don't have Elaine May or Singleton ones that I know. Of. Okay. I was just going to say Singleton is Ben's in the Haas. Done. Fair enough. Okay. Sure. Ben's done. in the Haas. Let's just get it over with. Can the nickname be the same, at, draw from the same material as the miniseries name, though? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> oh, you think you're just <laughs> okay. making it exactly that's, that's, right. that's my official right. decree. <laughs> okay. Uh huh. I don't and know what Elaine, I mean, I don't know. What's Elaine May? New Leaf, it doesn't feel like there's anything there. Ben Ishtar is sweaty. The Haas Break Kid. The Haas Break Kid. Yeah, sure. It's that's what Haas it is. Break, but, but also weigh in, guys. You know, yeah, feel free to clean in. up our exactly. mess here. Right. But I, th- I think Ben's in the Haas. Let's just keep it easy, right? I, I think we can do better than that, but I do not think now is the time. He used to spell his name with a Z. He put Z at the end of it. It's right I there. That's Ben's true. in the house. I had a, I had a yeah, whole face. That's, that's true. That's true. You Maybe if that. it chains into like one of the names that I feel like we haven't done that. That would work. That cool. Ben, of course, has uh, rebranded in 2021 to be all about chains and bones. <laughs> not that those weren't things before he's wearing a literal hat that says bones right he's now. wearing let's say he's wearing a hat that says bones and the letters are made out of bones it, wait is this a is this a congratulations uh production it is not i it's wish not? i could oh, i wow. wish i could claim credit for it so but... somebody just really had your number yep yeah that's I, great i know I love it. it's just like my personal brand you know uh let's also mention emily is wearing a directed uh, music by john carpenter hat music by yeah, thanks to the folks at Super Yaki. It's great that we are all wearing like really, you know, visually important uh, articles of clothing for this audio format. I'm wearing um, I'm wearing a forky hat and an Orco T-shirt, so I'm just a fucking self parody. I know we've been on for many years, but surely there's some new listener tuning in, being like, "Oh, they're covering John Carpenter. I love the films of John Carpenter." Yeah, 
20 minutes in, they're just like, why would anyone listen to this show? Well, David, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. John Carpenter was born on January 16th, 1948 to Milton Jean and Howard Carpenter in Carthage, New York. Yes, he's from he was born in the North Country. That's true. Yes. Yeah, so 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 we're just gonna hard pivot into Carpenter facts. Correct. John Carpenter, by the way, a winner of our March Madness this year. That's why we're covering him. Obviously, a long time mold candidate for us. Yes, but long time coming. Yeah. And, and in our completely flawless March Madness tournament this year that had no hiccups, normal. And no problems, and it was so normal where we pitted. Nice. All the hosts' choices against each other. Who, of course, was was John Carpenter being championed by? But Mr. Ben Hosley, the People's Champion. Yes. So Ben, this is your series in a way. This is a Ben's choice. It's really, it's but, like a a, a a long time coming. Please, Emily, what's up? No, I was going to say, but you hadn't, you haven't seen the inaugural film, which I was very excited for you to see personally. Like I just knew, okay, so I want to clear something up also. Like I'm, I'm, this is like through the fog of war from the March Madness uh, tournament, but I, I know that maybe some fans are out there. Like why is Emily kicking off this series? She campaigned pretty hard against Carpenter. And this is the spirit of March Madness. I love John Carpenter. I'm wearing a freaking John Carpenter hat right now. I have his albums in my cabinet. I have a fucking Dark Star poster on my wall. Like I love, I love him. And I just feel like he's a very over discussed uh, filmmaker, but that does not mean that I'm not excited to hear you guys discuss it because I know it'll be different. But also this movie, I feel like is under discussed. So that's why I wanted to lay claim to it. Early. Let's also say like a, a, a majority or at least a, a large uh, uh, quotient of the, uh, people who picked other competitors in March Madness are going to be guests in this miniseries. Like, th there, there is not animosity in the blank check community. People had their champions, but they understood uh, most of us uh, like most of these filmmakers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's all yeah. goodwill all around. Um, all love. And, and there's all like, love. I mean, I if it wasn't Dark Star, there would be like five other movies I would have like. But you... You said you wanted Dark Star. Yeah. What, I know. What, what, yeah. What, are, what What are some other faves for you? I, I mean, think yeah, that they, they live would probably be my next top choice. I think I think that's my favorite Carpenter. I I it's definitely the one I've seen the most. Um, and I I just think it has a very interesting. It's its legacy continues to evolve. So mm. I think that's always interesting to mm. get into. But, um, yeah. Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. God, what, what a fun, like, cold I mean, you classic, guys are going to have so much man. fun. Like, uh, like, I'm being a party pooper over. You guys are going to have a great, a great time. <laughs> no, you're not being a party pooper. Because I think, like, with, with my picks, like, Carpenter by far was, like, I think, probably the most, like, populist. And just, like, I feel like he's just, like, an all-around, like, guy that so many people can get behind. But... I think we're going to like, we're really going to, we got a researcher team now, right? We're going to be like coming in hot with new hot takes. And facts. But also I think we have like good uh, guest pairings for these movies. And Ben, uh, sure. uh, many months ago, you and I went to a drive-in double feature in the pandemic of Robocop and uh, Escape from New York, a very Griffin Ben night. And it was in the midst of March Madness. And in between the two movies, you turned to me and you said, I feel a little guilty about the fact that John Carpenter's like steamrolling everything. Is that going to be an uninteresting series? Like you were sort of saying, like, he's such a populist pick. He has so many big movies. They're so discussed. Is that going to be an uninteresting pick? And I was sort of saying to you, like, I, I, I think his films are very discussed and he is very discussed as a guy. But within our format of covering everything and going week by week, the arc yeah. of his career is very fascinating. Yeah. And it's particularly fascinating when you consider that he's a guy uh, who's... Uh, it, it's an arc we've not covered that much on this show, which is like one insane outsized hit at the beginning of the career, and then the rest of the career is failing to sort of reignite in that way. He got to make movies that are very personal and are distinctive, but, uh, you know, he always openly complained about the fact that he had to like fight tooth and nail for everything. He never got the budgets he wanted. He never had another hit on the same level as Halloween. He never had the studio support. Uh, it is just kind of fascinating when you look at like 
the this movie, which is a student film that then gets expanded to get a theatrical release, right? That's a lot of the tension of this movie that we'll get into is that it, it, they, he and Dan Bannon had made this 50 minute student short film that was in this nether realm where they were like, it's a little long for a short. It's a little short for a feature. It could either be the most incredible like student calling card film of all time, or you can make it, it, it shoot you know, another half of footage and put it in theaters. And uh, they did, and both of the guys kind of regretted stretching it out to feature length and how they've talked about it in the decades since. And it was like complete, like it was just, it, I mean, I know that it had like a proper premiere in LA, but like, was it distributed outside of LA or was it its theatrical release yes, just here? Mostly after Halloween though. Like it had its oh, okay. little release yeah, before, yeah, yeah. but after Halloween, they brought it back out in like 1979 with like post alien. So they could right. advertise it as writer of alien director of Halloween. You know, they, there was a, there's a space movie they both made and that's how they, they tried to sell. I, it. I mean, I, this I think movie is, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, it, I mean, it sounds like it got a release, but it was like a crappy kind of grindhouse release. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it did play. Yeah. Um, it was, it was distributed by a porn company. But but here's the thing, Emily. If you look at the reviews, most of the good reviews come from the re-release. When it first came out, most critics didn't even touch it. Right, yeah. I mean, I... I it's funny that it got re released after Alien. That makes a lot of sense because I, I love this film as, like, the first Carpenter film and I love it as, like, the pr primordial soup of so much stuff to come, but I love it as a pre-Alien movie. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's so on that level, because there's like yeah. so few examples of essentially a comedy being remade as a more serious film, you know, yeah. like this movie has kind of the same relationship in a way that like uh, Airplane has to zero hour, except it's the other way around. Right. Yeah. That yeah. like they make this comedy. I mean, the story is that like Dan O'Bannon goes to one of the houses where the movie is playing opening weekend with John Carpenter. And they go to the manager and they're like, is the audience liking it? Like, are they laughing? And the guy goes, what audience? And they open the door. <laughs> it's like opening night. There are four people in the theater and they're stone silent. And they realize <laughs> that no one knew it was a comedy. And that when they released this the first time, they had tried to like this crappy sort of porn distributor had tried to in like an Ed Wood style, like, you know, pre-packaging, like sell the genre elements tried to sell it as, oh, this is the next 2001 A Space Odyssey. So people went assuming it was going to be this sort of like uh, a solemn uh, meditation on space. And then they just thought, oh, this is bad rather than understanding it was intentionally uh, funny. I mean, it has a very like its title suggests something more foreboding and, and austere than it is. Like I, the first time I saw it, I didn't know what to expect at all from it. And I just thought it was going to be like a, you know, scrappy. Yeah. Like a scrappy, spooky space movie, which it is. It's just like a very, very different tone than what one might expect. But yeah, I, I watched, yeah. I watched it last night for the first time and had that exact same experience where until it started, I didn't realize it was a comedy. I had always assumed that it was like, oh, it's the bootstrappy, like, oh, look at how resourceful we are with special effects and production values movie, but that it was a totally straight, serious thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, I loved it. So, yeah, I also just watched it like literally this morning for the first time. The sense of humor is so off kilter. It's yeah. I love it. I love future stuff, right? I mean, I love the VFX. It's so effective. Mm -hmm. Like again, low budget, like all of the lettering, all of the like screens they create for the consoles. It's like amazing. Yeah. Um, but there it's just like it's like a weird stoner like space crew who all are all kind of like just like morose and like half dead. It's hilarious. It's I a think ship it's of so bends. great. It's it a is. ship of bends. It's a real dirt bag space. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. I, it's like they just won't fix parts of the ship and they've just given up on life. It's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just funny because like, I don't know. I said like dirt bag spaceship and I was also thinking of like stuff like, I don't know, like fucking Firefly and stuff like that while I was watching this. And I was like, but this is like, funnier because none of these guys are being sold as cool 
Like, yes. it's just like, this is actually how depressing and how like sapped of life you would be after 20 years in space and basically like a like small tunnel with like a toilet. Like, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it just it like yeah. kind of sucks. Yeah. Yeah. So as right, as we know, this movie's written by Dan O'Bannon and Carpenter, right? And O'Bannon goes on to make Alien and Alien is the movie where space is a job and these guys are blue collar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this is that magnify this is and carpenter what's his line where it's like it's about like what about how do you like wash your underwear in space or whatever right right yeah like you know that's what i care about how do you clean your underwear when, when you're on a spaceship because he'd seen 2001 he was like what's all this religious mumbo jumbo no i want to know about just like having to, to fix day. the fucking plumbing yeah. like on the spaceship well to roll back to sort of general carpenter table setting for a moment i i feel like you sort of go like, what are John Carpenter's defining characteristics, right? He is like aggressively unpretentious while being this guy who sort of did high minded genre. He always like has been very saucy and sort of spoken out against other filmmakers and other popular films of the time and sort of hates any movie that's highfalutin and self-serious. Uh, there was a clip that that was being circulated during March Madness when he was up against my competitor. Robert Altman, where he was just like fucking body slamming Altman, giving him the people's elbow, just saying like, yeah, he's just like a lessy, messy, lazy, self-indulgent like asshole. Uh, he's like uh, talked a lot my about boys fight. Yeah, he, but he also <laughs> like there was a recent interview where he talked about how like uh, David Cronenberg acts like he's like too classy for Carpenter now. And he resents the fact that like Cronenberg felt the need to like remake himself as a prestige filmmaker and all of that. But, you know, aggressively unpretentious, aggressively unsentimental, uh, very sort of politically minded uh, or, you know, at least sociopolitically minded and incredibly resourceful. Yes. Although he's always like, I'm resourceful because no one gives me any money. Like, I don't want to do all this shit. Like, he's also very unpretentious about is the fact that he edits and scores and, you know, he's like, yeah. look, if I could hire Jerry Goldsmith, I'd do it. But no one ever pays me enough money. I mean, our uh, our research uh, uh, researcher, J.J. Burch, uh, pulled up and heard this quote where he was like, not only saying, like, I only do the music because I'm cheap. I only edit because I'm cheap. But uh, saying, like, I hate writing. I w wish I could never write a screenplay ever. Yeah, here's his line. He said, uh, I, I would love to give up writing films. I hate writing. I hate editing. I'm only doing it out of self-defense because there's no one else who can do it to my liking. And the reason I've done the music on my films is because I'm the cheapest and the best I know for the price. But he's also just like one of the best. Like, I yeah. don't know. Like, and he's clearly proud of himself as a musician. Like, yeah. he does like DJ sets. He releases albums. Like, He does I concerts mean, with his son. Yeah. He goes on tour and plays all of his soundtracks. Yeah. I mean, he, I, he has to, at this point, at least have reappraised that because clearly, I don't know. I mean, people love it. His father had a PhD in music, was a session musician for big ass people like Johnny Cash and Frank Sinatra, Roy Orbison. And uh, his dad was an army band leader, organist and choir director, principal violinist in Nashville Symphony, like very kind of Tony musician background. And Carpenter started out with music at a very young age. I think that was uh, sort of pushed on him, but he took to it. And then movies kind of became the hobby. And it was sort of a coin flip between movies and music for him. He started going to University of Kentucky, uh, Western Kentucky, where um, his father taught. taught. Right. And then he decided to uh, transfer to USC to do film. Um, so, I mean, he, you know, music is not a dalliance for him. I mean, a very Ben fact about him is that he was in a rock band called Kaleidoscope in Kentucky. That just sounds like something Ben would do in the 70s or 60s or whatever. But he he's also he is this generation, like the first generation to grow up with uh, film cameras in the home. You know, he said the African Queen was the first movie he saw, which is another interesting thing to consider that like, oh, right. For so long, kids movies didn't really exist. And the first movies kids would see when they were four or five would be adult movies, would be Humphrey Bogart, like a fucking arguing with Catherine Hepburn. On a boat. Yeah. And that's what your parents take you to when you're a toddler. But he also like he but the things he liked was like he saw it came from outer space and that blew his mind. Right. Like things like that, like the thing from another world, obviously. 
um, is uh, King Kong, right? Like, you know, it's, it's the genre of movies that, that kids could engage with. Right. The earnest appreciation of genre movies, not like claiming them, like reclaiming them in some sort of trash camp way, but just like, this is the world I want to live in. Howard Hawks is his all time favorite guy. Rio Bravo is like his favorite movie of all time, which he sort of remakes with uh, Assault on Precinct 13. But he right. talked a lot about how like that's the filmmaker he wanted to be. Like there, there are interviews with him in 1978, like right after Halloween at the absolute peak of his career, where he's like, I'm out of step with all the filmmakers of my generation and the industry at this time. I wish I could be transported back to the 1940s. I wish I was a guy who could make five movies a year for the studio and have access to that equipment and those stars and all of that. <sighs> oh, what are you sighing about, Griffey? No, I'm just being kind of wistful. Okay, why was that? I'm just imagining a better world. Such as I what would know. be a part of this better God, world, you know, um, world peace. Right, you know, uh, into, universal health care, right, right, pre-K, right. Um, housing as a right, not a privilege. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe if it was possible to get a list of great candidates the moment you post a job online. Okay, I don't know, just the basic one, necessities. That last one is actually very achievable What with Indeed Instant Match. Okay, instant the match. minute you post a sponsored job, you get quality candidates whose resumes match your job description. Okay, God listen it. to me. God, if only the major, uh, the Democratic Party hired Indeed, we could well, get some good candidates. Well, <laughs> all right, well, let's not get political, but when hiring gets hard, you need Indeed. And anyone who wants to hear this message yeah. can, you know, take listen. what they want away Please from listen. it. It's a job site. It makes hiring incredibly simple. You just attract, interview, and hire. Okay? Those are the three steps. AIH. You can do it all in one place, even in interviewing. You don't hope that your perfect candidate will find you. Indeed is going to cut through the noise to hire faster and smarter. Indeed Instant Match provides a list of quality candidates who resumes are on Indeed already the mm. moment you post a sponsored job. The right? moment. Moments in all caps. They really want you to know it's the moment. And you can invite them to apply right away. Yep. Uh, candidates you invite are three times more likely to apply than a job you just see in a search alone. Yeah. Plus, I've heard a rumor. I don't know if this is true. I don't know if I'm talking out of school here. Yeah. I've heard a rumor that with Instant Match, Indeed data shows 90% of employers mm. get quality candidates from Indeed's resume database as soon as they sponsor a job post according to Indeed data. I don't know if I... And can you say yes, that on Mike? I look, don't know if we should cut that out. According to Town Nest, Indeed delivers four times more hires than any other job okay. combined. So All you're, right. you're verifying that. Yeah. You can get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash check. Get a $75 credit mm. at Indeed.com slash check. Indeed.com slash check. Offer valid through September 30th. Terms and conditions apply. Gotta jump on this on September 30th, folks. Yeah, it's funny. He's a new Hollywood generation guy, but not he's you know, he doesn't feels a really little anomalous. In. Yeah. I mean, when you think about him like this coming out two years before Star Wars or whatever, and you know, he goes on to make stuff that's pretty populous, but like in a completely different way than like a Jaws or whatever. Yeah, this came out in 75. So it's like this, yeah. I mean, it feels like both aware of that wave of filmmaking and like completely on another like wavelength i don't know uh i mean here here's a really good quote from him talking about like his love of uh howard hawks right uh he said i believe shot should tell the story first and foremost so much because when you use the camera to express an emotion by an exaggerated angle or something that's fine but if you have to do it because what's happening on screen is not interesting or compelling enough then you're in trouble if people are talking, that's more important than the director saying, hey, look at me. I'm a director. I can do all this. Who cares about that anyway? The audience cares about what's on the screen. Film school allowed me to grab the camera and zoom in and out and show off. I hate show offs and I hate pretension. Like he's like, I got all that experimentation out of my system. You make the movie in the most like direct, clean way possible. And you think about like against his contemporaries, there's so much experimentation. There's so much like very visible in your face sort of like, uh, style in New Hollywood, right? You have all the still like runoff of the the uh, Nouvelle Vague influence and you have these genre directors coming in and like trying to reinvent the language and make everything really splashy and also like push forward special effects. And he's just kind of a guy who like gets it done. That's also why it's funny. He says he like doesn't like writing because I think, I mean, when you said that, I was like, I think I like John Carpenter as much, if not more so as a writer. Hard to agree. 
than uh, as a director. I mean, like I, I, whatever, he's a great director, but like, I think that especially funny Carpenter is some of my favorite shit in the world, like writing wise and, and, and humor wise, timing wise, all of that. I don't know. It's, it's no, you're right. He's so funny. And he's usually like 10 years ahead of the joke in terms of Hollywood. I feel like that is why so often he sort of flops with the studios because he'll make a movie like Big Trouble in Little China. And then like for years after, we just be like, nobody got what I was going for above me. People like who saw the movie eventually got it. You know what I mean? But like yeah. the whole the whole time the studio is like, wait, why isn't this like points to, you know, mainstream hit? Like, why isn't this like that? I thought that's what you were giving us. And he's like, no, no, no. Like, that's boring. Like, and Dark Star, this movie feels like 50 years ahead. Yeah. Of, like, if this movie came out now and looked, you know, fancy or whatever, but was the same, like, this would still be an insanely clever bit of commentary. This on, is an like, HBO Max original, baby. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this movie would take it to the max. Absolutely. No, but it, it is interesting that he's like, I wish I was in the 40s. And then he makes all these movies that don't get appreciated until like 10 or 20 years later. He's like unmoored from the time he's making them. And he's both like, behind and ahead of the movements. But it's also funny that he's like, I hate this visual, like the, this splashy show off shit. And it's like, dude, you invented like, you know, voyeuristic steady cam shots. And sure. the, you know, yeah, you, yeah. there's like all of your language is like baked into modern cinema. Like yeah. you, you're, you could be a flashy director, but he's not a, I know what's the word. He's just not like a braggy director. That's not quite the word I'm looking for. Well, he's not pretentious. It's not like, pretentious. No, yeah. and you think of like De Palma working at the same time, someone who's like really showing off his understanding of like cinematic language. He's not pretentious. I mean, yeah, you know, like <laughs> all these quotes JJ pulled up, all these interviews like from 1978, you know, where he's just shitting all over. Close Encounters in 2001. And he's like, Spielberg fucked it up. Like, here you go. Make us flying saucer movie. What's with all this like morose shit? But th this is the other thing we have to say. This will come up in every episode, I'm sure. He is Hollywood's all time shit poster. Yes. He will just give an interview to Fangoria or who, you know, like anyone who calls up basically and be and just growl at them. He's, so he's been available. doing that since he was young. It's not like he did that now in retirement. He's gotten more salty. He's always been salty. Yeah. Like he, he loves to be salty. He's a salty old space dog. One could argue. Man, he I would have loved salty. to have hung out with him when he was just like a chain smoking young guy in the seventies. He seems like Probably he was such a, a character. No, oh, of course. Yeah. But I'm just like to see him in his prime. Like he's just strikes me as such a like he's like in a weird guy in that he's like very like artful, but kind of a tough guy. I don't know. That's like a real type that I love. You know, he also is one of these guys where like he looks so incredible now. Like this is how he's meant to look his entire life. And then you look at photos of him in like his 20s and you're like, that's a really, really young looking old dude. Like it doesn't. He never yeah. feels like a young man. It feels like he just aged into what he was supposed to be. Like he fits into that horror director thing where you're like, that looks like what a horror director should look like. Yeah, it's like, is this guy about to warn me not to go down that road? He looks like the guy <laughs> at the gas station who's like, well, I've been in a lot of trouble for the young guys, the young kids out here. Right. And he has this sort of like visible bitterness on his face at all times that he can't hide. But also when he does interviews down, people are like, will you ever make another movie? And he's like, I don't care. I'm old. I'm just going to become the best at playing Xbox. That's my goal now. Right. I just want to get Fortnite. better at Xbox. Right. But he just always says, like, that's my only thing. He's up there with Miyazaki as far as like kind of like shit post uh, yeah. soundbite old guy directors and I love them both like I want them to be my grandpa and, and they're <laughs> like, both guys that like I feel like people come to them on their knees being like you are my idol and he, they just like smoke a cigarette and they're like I am you know I'm merely a plumber anime was a mistake <laughs> <laughs> right. shut the fuck up I made a good sandwich yesterday that's the only thing you should respect <laughs> about me yeah <laughs> <laughs> like resentment towards anyone who respects them too much. I want to be like that someday. I feel like I feel like we will have achieved like gender parity in cinema when there's when there's well, I guess Elaine May is kind of like that too, in a way. She's sort of I think Elaine May's got some of that. Claire Denise got some of that. Certainly when she bodied David in that interview about <laughs> sweet. Wait, what? 
She didn't body me in the interview. She bodied me prior to the interview. Wait, what did she say? <laughs> Can we, should we take it off air? Oh, I've, t- I've told the story on Mike, but basically I tried to bond with her over our sweet green orders because we were eating the same sweet green thing. And she looked at me like I was a worm, as she should, and said, aren't you just supposed to ask me questions? You tried to bond with Claire Denis over your sweet green orders. <laughs> I mean, I just tried to begin a dialogue she get a with true her. Mommy? Like, you know what? Guacamole I think we both greens? had harvest bowls. I can't remember. <laughs> shrew mommy. <laughs> Imagine presenting a shrew mommy to her and being being like, "What this is called is a shrew mommy." She would, she would <laughs> melt you. She'd melt you. It's a play on umami, the fifth taste. <laughs> uh, uh, this is this movie is a real shrew mommy. It's so dark star. So I wait. So Emily and I are the only ones who've seen it before. I saw Dark Star. You. I think I also expected when I watched Dark Star. I think I thought it was a straight up horror movie. I think that's, and it had that poster of the frozen guy. I know it has very scary. Like, it's got a very scary poster. It's, it's a scary poster. Right. Yeah. So I think maybe I thought it was like people getting picked off on this and it's called dark star, which sounds, and then I, I, I cue it up and I'm like, it is a student film. And like, that's their take where they're like, this was like the best student film and kind of a mediocre movie, right? Like, you know, it, it should have been a student film forever. Right. It's at the top of the heap as a student film. That's what a Carpenter or O'Bannon think. But it's so special, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. It's funny without being remotely quippy or like, what's the word? Not clever, but like self-aware. Yeah. And it's so dense with themes, even though it also isn't that interested in exploring them. Or like, it's not going to dig too deep. But like, if you want to think about Dark Star and about bombs becoming self-aware... And like things like that, you can have a you could think about it for weeks. Yeah. I mean, I think like to go back to the title, I feel like the trick that this movie pulls. And I mean, it's 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 weird to talk about it like that because it is a student film and it is a little off the cuff. But I think tonally it isn't a parody. And this when you like as I did last night, when you stream it on um, why can I think of what it's called when you get a movie on Apple? Apple movies, Apple TV, Apple TV. Apple TV. Okay. I mean, I got it on the Apple. I watched it on the Apple TV, whatever. I don't know. My brain is burnt. Uh, but yeah, when you get it, like the little summary on it is like in this spoof on 2001, a space odyssey, which I can see like Griffin's background right now is the 2001, a space travesty DVD cover apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, it's not that. And I, I, it had been a second since I saw this movie and I was like I don't think that's what it is is it and then I started watching it's like no it's not a parody but it's funny and it doesn't need to be a parody to be funny like it's not aren't space movies stupid it isn't even like I mean I maybe Carpenter feels like this personally but it doesn't feel like it wasn't 2001 stupid movie it's just like no I have a different set of questions to ask about space yes (laughs) yeah like it doesn't feel like a parody it does feel like a movie that generates from Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon, like talking about 2001 for six hours after seeing it. Yeah. And Carpenter just being like, I don't understand why Stanley Kubrick wouldn't be interested in asking these 12 questions, you know? It's basically like, like does bong rip post 2001? Right. And it's like. (laughs) Which many did. What if you could just like talk to Hal about phenomenology like (laughs) with that would that solve your problems Uh, i'm looking at the posters here right and these are from the original release i believe both there's the one with the frozen guy and the tagline at the top is the spaced out odyssey dark star the mission of the strange love generation which is very much making it sound like some trippy absurdist comedy right yeah and then the other poster is mostly like the ship And then it says, from Alan Dean Foster, first 2001 A Space Odyssey, then the Poseidon Adventure, now Dark Star, a bombed out in space with a spaced out bomb. So they're they're going for the stone. This movie was initially distributed by a pornographer, I believe, right? Like the deep throat guy. And so they're they're going for, you know, they just want to try and drag in some stoned just like make college it a students head movie, basically, which I mean, it's not not that it's like, as I 
texted you guys before. I think this is the most stoned movie you have ever covered. It is. And I, I went through every episode a bit just to make sure that you were right. But there was nothing that even comes close. Yeah. This is a stoned movie, but this is like a really stoned movie in that sometimes it trails off and everyone's just kind of sitting in silent for in silence for a few minutes. And then everyone was like, what are we, wait, what were we talking about? <laughs> like, are you like, it, it, it actually has that energy. It's not trying to do that in a uh, professional, uh, populist yeah. Hollywood kind of way. Sometimes you're just such watching the movie and you're like, you're just watching some guys sitting on mattresses <laughs> right. and like, when did the scene begin? <laughs> What's this scene about? I would love to see this movie in a theater. Like th- yes. this is, I, I saw it, uh, at Metrograph, uh, yeah. A while ago. Yeah. yeah. Rolls. It was a shitty, shitty print, but it was yeah. fun as hell. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if a good version of this movie exists. Like there was also there were multiple sources. It's 16 millimeter largely. Um, I don't think it's ever been restored. Uh, Dana Bannon always kind of shit on every home video release of it looking bad until I think the Blu-ray release was the first one he sort of approved of. He also I mean, they, you know, did not get along very well. Uh, split off after this movie. Right. Let's do a little Dan O'Bannon talk. Dan O'Bannon is just the king of not getting along with anybody. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think Dan O'Bannon might just be a bit of a, a rough hang if you want to, you know, professionally mount a movie. <laughs> like, right? Like, he's, yeah. even though he's in the fucking thing, he's all over the. He's, let's talk about Dan O'Bannon, Griffin. And Emma, uh-huh. yeah. I assume you also love Dan O'Bannon. Of course. Yeah. I mean, also, like, like, uh, yes, he goes on to do iconic things after this. I love his performance in this movie. <laughs> he's, he's so funny. <laughs> very funny in this movie. In, in that kind of natural, I don't give a shit, sort of, yeah. like, it, 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 impossible to fake kind of way. So yeah. he plays Pinback, of course, uh, mm-hmm. who is the, I, I always forget, because it's the inspiration for Pinbacker and Sunshine. There's another pin. There's a lot of Pinback. There's a band in, Pinback. Let's not forget. Sure. Pinback. <laughs> right. We cannot forget. Uh, only early 2000s kids. <laughs> but so he, Griff, he's a USC guy too, right? He's, uh, yes. he, he, I believe he says that he found an ad for USC film school in a Playboy and was like, all right, I'll go God there. Damn. Like that was how he got to U- USC. Uh, he makes this movie with Carpenter. That makes me so mad. Sorry. I'm just like, <laughs> for so Wait, many reasons. Why does it make you mad? <laughs> Emily, do you think there's something wrong with the pipeline of who gets to work in Hollywood and who was? It welcome? makes me mad. First of all, that USC film school was advertised in a magazine as if it was like full sale university or something. And then it makes me mad that it was Playboy. <laughs> I'm just like, oh God. Okay. That explains literally everything. Uh, carry on. <laughs> I think back then, right? This it was still sort of like, are people really going to go to yeah, film, film school? school? Like, right? Like, but this would have been the time school? where it was like that. This is just post the time because well, like all the all the like seventies film rat guys were going to school in the sixties and like I guess early seventies when it was aggressively uncool to right. like want to work in Hollywood, and then they ended up turning it around for the most part. But this would have been like kind of just post that wave and like you start to see that generation kind of making good i I say making good in quotes (laughs) because but even so like them advertising in playboy is like if usa to uh, usc today was uh like buying a lot of sponsored posts on r slash incels yeah like it was like are you too horny and feel ostracized by your community? Come make movies. Listen, I have no problem with, with horny people making movies, as we discussed pre-record. Sure, uh, yes. All for it. I just, and honestly, like, it's not quite that. Like, I think that there's there's probably a little bit of a lighter touch to the average uh, Playboy reader in 1972 or whatever. Than, than people who post on our insult? I, I, hmm, interesting. But uh, they might be a little bit more sex positive, but in in a completely retrograde way. But I don't even hmm. want to get into it. But yeah, whatever. I don't have to. It's self explanatory, <laughs> you know. I mean, I just want to read. Uh, uh, JJ put up a lot of wild quotes about uh, Dana Bannon, who is uh, was a wild, wild fucking uh, human being, including some of his uh, very, very odd public statements about women. But I just want to share this one because I feel like it it kind of sums up his attitude. Uh, girls always considered me creepy. But I'm used to being alone now. 
Of all the areas in my life, the most terrible with the least success has been with women. When I was a kid, I wanted to get laid so bad. I was such a horny kid. In my 20s, I grew up a little and I wanted a stable relationship with one lady. It didn't work. I see other people happy in relationships and I'm such an envious person. Dot, dot, dot. I hadn't had a baker's dozen of women until I was 28. Then I got money when we started working on Alien. Since then, I must have had 300 women. I fuck my brains out. Washington Post, July 29th, 1979. What the hell? I've never heard this before. Yep. What? A lot of things there. A baker's dozen of women? Is this a well-known, like, no, is this a no, well-known thing no. about Dan O'Bannon? Like, I didn't know. I didn't know. And also, I've never heard someone cite the baker's dozen of women. Like, that's some fucking benchmark. Every Everyone's so excited to hit their baker's dozen. It's the fucking 13th punch on your smoothie card. Like, that's what he's making it sound like. It was so Ew, hard for me to get to a gross. baker's Why did dozen. Why it have to be a smoothie card? I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so Dan O'Bannon, for people who don't know, after making this movie, he is such an inventive uh, guy, especially in terms of special effects. This movie is like the first ever hyperspace effect, basically, right? This sort of like, mm -hmm. you know, like that's the fr that George Lucas calls him up and is like, come work on Star Wars. And he was like busy working on Jodorowsky's Dune. So he didn't even get to work on the production of Star Wars. He worked on it in post-production, I think. Like he's the kind of like elbow grease and scotch tape type like visual effects genius who can sort of come up with something that the movie making has not yet figured out how to represent and then also he's this absolute fucking maniac who writes these brilliant screenplays and then hollywood gets them and is like can, can all right make that guy send him to a desert or something we're gonna clean this up you know what i mean yeah. like with like someone uh pick him up in a cab and then he has a nervous breakdown and right yeah. say you're taking him to the playboy <laughs> mansion and drop him off in like nevada i don't want to hear from him again but also he created alien so he just made money for the rest of his life like he just had that original story credit that paid out every time they did fucking anything with Alien as a property. Like, if you look at his IMDb, it's like 27 writing credits that are created characters based on characters created by for every fucking like Alien video game and what have you. And, and you know, as much as we might not have Alien without this movie, we might not have it without Jodorowsky's Dune because he like... I think he wrote, like, I don't know. I read that he wrote Alien kind of in the wake of having a complete nervous breakdown after that movie collapsed. And, like, it's kind of funny because, like, Dark Star is before nervous breakdown and Alien is post. Like, <laughs> seems like a fun guy. <laughs> the the yeah. two things sound like the Yodorowsky Dune experience, like, uh, turning him, curdling him even more than he was before. Made him, like, a complete basket case, yeah. But also that, like, he was really fucking affected by the failure of Dark Star and like that moment where he walks into the screening room at the theater and no one's laughing and they don't get it's a comedy. And that like Alien was this vindictive movie of like, oh, I tried to make a comedy and they took it on the level and thought it was dumb. Yeah, fine. I'll do the same movie, but make it fucking horrifying and aggressive. Did you guys, I mean, because I, I watched the Blu-ray, like, which has a note by him at the beginning. Did you guys get the note? I did not. I, I should have gotten the Blu-ray. I will purchase it now. There's a note that just scrolls by written by him where he, he talks about the no one was laughing at the first screening. And, you know, he, he brings that up and he's basically like, this is a comedy. You have to laugh at it. Like he's, try, he's trying it ahead of you watching the movie to be just, just FYI. Like you, you don't have to, there's some funny line at the end where he's like, you don't have to laugh unless I'm in the room is, is his sort of, but it does have that kind of energy of like, well, none of you fuckers got it. I guess I should type something up. Well, the funny thing is that like, when I saw this in a theater, I remember it wasn't a super packed theater. And I was doing like this is a movie that elicits like explosive sudden laughter from me because it's so absurd. So I was just like yelping by myself in this theater. And I will say that like there it wasn't like riotous in the house. Like it was kind of me just making loud noises. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe it's not for everybody. <laughs> it's a very particular sense of humor. It's very understated. 
it does feel like the movie is not pitched like a comedy. Like the movie does not telegraph to you. No. It's right. a comedy in its filmmaking style, which I think throws people off. Like you have to come kind of meet it on its level. It is fascinating that like, considering that he goes on to work on Star Wars, that he creates Alien, that he does Return of the Living Dead, which is like he writes and directs and that's a huge cult movie in its own right, that Dan O'Bannon felt it feels like spent 40 years being like the ambassador of Dark Star in the way that like Bob Gale has committed his career to being like the ambassador of Back to the Future and just continue to fucking do interviews and screenings and supervise all these home video releases and do documentaries. And like Carpenter kind of like has refused to look back on this movie is like, it's my one movie that's amateurish. We never should have made it a feature. I don't really want to talk about it. Whereas Dan O'Bannon like went back and re-edited it two times, like was adamant about constantly trying to contextualize this movie so that people would get it like and and tinkering with it. Of, yeah, there's a special kind of sickness of like retooling your student film that much. Like, right. I, I recently right. watched my thesis film like not that long ago after, I don't know, a decade of having not seen it. And I was like, oh, I never want to watch that again in my life. There's a reason I haven't watched that for 10 years. <laughs> right. And like. Dana Bannon was like, I am committed to one day getting the response I want at a screening from this movie. Like, how do I get people's heads in the right space? How do I change the movie itself? I want this thing to play the way it did in my mind. It'd be one thing if he hadn't gone on to do anything else. That's the thing. Exactly. Just, like, That's what's so wild about it. What yes. A, what a crazy man. I I know. You know, you know whatever. It's it's so fucking odd. Um, yes. What a what a brilliant person. Uh yep. and and what a performance. Um I mean that 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 letter that you uh mentioned like at the top of the blue voice just yeah. I mean it sounds like I mean it just sounds very pin, pin back leaving his his diary entry that nobody appreciates me here. It's it's so funny. And if you look at like the IMDB quotes page for this movie, it just kind of reads like weird Twitter posts. Yes. Yes. You know, the increasing trend of weird Twitter doing like dialogue exchanges within a fictional yeah. reality that you're dropped into and you're having to sort of like surmise the context within only 180 characters or whatever. Uh, what is it now? 240 uh, reminds me of that. But yes, they get like a thousand dollars from USC. Uh, USC would put up a small amount of the budget for these movies, but in exchange, technically retained the rights to any student films, which comes into play later because they literally had to like heist the film canisters from the USC campus in order to be able to give it to this distributor to release. I think that's still the way that USC worked, at least when I was in film school, because I remember everybody being like, oh, well, you know, we don't even want to be at USC because you don't get to own your film. And it's just like, oh, but everybody who goes to USC on to have uh, much right. more fruitful careers. <laughs> Wait, did Carpenter graduate? I can't remember. Didn't he like kind of leave school and not finish because of this movie? Um, I'm not sure if he graduated. I don't know. He I feel like he walked away and just was like, well, whatever. I'm not going to be told what to do. Uh, I yeah, he did quit. Yes, he quit at USC to make his first. Yes, he quit to make this wow, movie. Okay. And, uh, we should, he made a movie at USC called Captain Voyeur that is an obvious precursor to Halloween and that it's about a person stalking a woman and it's got like sort of some of the visual elements. Uh, he made he worked on a movie called The Resurrection of Bronco Billy that was like an Oscar -na winner, I think, for short film. Yeah, it won for short film. But he didn't direct but he wrote it and he edited it and, you know, he like did the music. He, it was like his first big effort. Has anyone seen that? No. No. Uh, no, I've never seen it. Uh, I, yeah, I should check it out. I think it was a hit enough that like Universal like put it in theaters for a long time. Like it was, it was, you know, whatever. They would throw it on, they would, it'd throw it in front of a feature, right? But it, it was like well regarded enough. Yeah, it's, it's a 23 minute short film. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all cool. I know I say this all the time, but like, we can't discuss the plot of Dark Star, can we? There's not really no, like we really a can't. I mean, it, there's guys. They're on. They're a blowing ship up planets. That blows up planets, right? <laughs> to sort of clear out space, right? There, there's also this odd fact 
there's like a 50 minute movie that they shot that then a year or two later they went back and both were like, let's improvise some shit. Like this is the only time Carpenter was like I ever allowed improv. We were sort of like making stuff up on the day, not just improvised dialogue, but like improvising plot lines and uh, character movements and whatever. Um, but also like the entire fucking beach ball with the claw sequences in the reshoots later. Yeah, like, I was going to say that feels yes. lifted right. in. Right. There's like a 40 or 50 minute short film here that is just these guys have been here for 20 years. They hate each other. They hate this fucking job. They wish they hadn't signed up for it. It's like mundane hell. As he put it, it's like waiting for Godot in space. And then there's like 50 minutes interspersed in the movie of these like weird closed looped plot lines or conflicts. Well, specifically the the alien one. Like, yeah. And the into- like there's a prolonged kind of pinback versus the alien sequence, which is just like I remember kind of the first time I saw that. I probably had had some drinks and I remember just like my mind completely wandering. <laughs> it's just, uh, yes, it goes on forever and ever. It's Looney Tunes. Yeah, it's it just, a, yeah. It, it's like an extended Looney Tunes bit. Like yeah. that's what it feels like. It's literally a beach ball with claws. Like I saw someone describe it that way. And I was like, oh, that's like them calling the alien, the big chap or something. And then you look at it it's like, no, it's a, it's a beach ball with claws. Yeah. Um, that makes a little squeaky sound. And I think they just like spray painted some rings on it. <laughs> like it's yes. It's so it's so purposefully janky. But it's also like, again, like, yes, this goes on to be a xenomorph later for Daniel Panem, but like, I don't know. It also is such a carpenter creature, which is the other thing I love about carpenters creature shit. Like I love I love creepy things, puppets, all all that stuff. Uh, and yes. this is just such a this just feels like such a rudimentary first one that it's very like precious to witness. <laughs> it's very it's super cute. Um that set though of where the elevator is going up and down is super impressive. Yeah. I mean, you can tell they shot it like with with him on his stomach and everything, but it's yes. still like that's the fun thing. It's like, oh, that must have been so fun to figure out and shoot and all that and be like on your shitty like school soundstage or whatever, like with your little cardboard set and like make this entire, you know, cl- literal cliffhanger action sequence. I'm like, oh, that's the good stuff. That's so fun. David? Yep. I think. Is it spring again? Um, I suppose. Or is it summer? Well, it's summer. Yeah. Is it daytime? Yeah. Is it nighttime? Well, I don't understand. What's my age again, David? What is time? That's what I'm saying. It's confusing. We've lived a weird couple of years here. It's hard to know which way is up, when is what. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I, 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 don't, I don't know anything. All I know is that it may be time for a change. Yeah, that makes you feel comfortable, makes your home look good. Yeah, especially around the house. You need a way to mix it up. Who knows? We might be soon spending more time at home again. Right, right. Well, look. If your everyday started to feel ordinary, Absolutely. transform it into something magical by yeah. upgrading your bedding, your yeah. loungewear, your towels, mm-hmm. your robes. Mm-hmm. You can get all of this from one place, Brooklyn Inn. Rich and Rich Vicky. and Vicky Fulop but started I, Brooklyn Inn. As a in. joke, called them Vic and Richie. Right. But they started Brooklyn Inn to create be- beautiful, high-quality home essentials that don't mm-hmm. cost an arm and a leg. Okay. Yeah. It's been a success. We all know of about course. it. We love them. I love their vibe. You know, I they cornered them at a the bar. I let them know that I'll be happy to buy them around if they're interested. Right. They luxury available without luxury sure. markups. Of course, they started with the sheets, but they've got everything you need. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the buttery, soft, breathable sheets. Sure. Mm-hmm. Plush and absorbent towels, yeah. though. Cozy robes and comfy loungewear. Griff, I just got some new comfy loungewear from Brooklyn. Ooh. I don't know about you. I got a. I they got sent a, me a little shipment. I got a little Brooklyn t-shirt. They get, I got some I got some pants too. I got a t-shirt oh. and I got some new sheets and I'm loving them. Look, they're so confident in their core products. They come with this 365 day warranty and fans are confident too. They've received 75,000 five star reviews and counting and their customer service. They're a dream to work with. If you have any issue, clearly they get their eight hours every night. Griffin. Oh boy. And I can only imagine in. how well they sleep. Uh, 75,000 plus five star reviews. Pretty good. Sounds like they're certified fresh. That's right. So give yourself the comfort refresh you deserve and get it for less at Brooklinen. Go to brooklinen.com and use promo code blank check to get $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's B R O K L I N E N.com. 
and enter promo code blank check for twenty dollars off. You get and the minimum one purchase of a hundred of a hundred dollar purchase. A great deal. Brooklynin.com promo code blank check. One word. Twenty dollars off. It's gonna be great. Vic and Richie. At least as Wikipedia puts it, right? They they shoot the forty five minute thing, yep. sixteen millimeter, six thousand dollars. Then people pitch them on the idea of going theatrical with it. This Canadian distributor named Jack Murphy uh, gives them the support uh, to shoot 50 minutes uh, three years later. And that's uh, the asteroid storm uh, uh, playing the bottles uh, as musical instruments, the sleeping quarters, uh, all the stuff in the hallway and the the whole beach ball alien uh, plot line. Right. Um, Then. John Landis, who's friends with O'Bannon, what a surprise, uh, (laughs) brings the movie to Jack Harris, who's a different producer distributor who got the rights somehow. And he thought 30 minutes of what was in the movie was boring and unusable. So then he cut that out and had them shoot an additional chunk of 35 millimeter footage after that. So there's like three different shooting periods for this movie. And I think it's getting more and more slapstick as it goes on. Like the original That's the other thing. student yes. film was this more sort of solemn, odd, work, workers in space type thing. And it just gets goofier and goofier. Right. Yes, exactly. Um, and it, I think the more stuff is also like there's no more script. So they're just like, just improvise, just you know, come up with shit. And Carpenter talks about it, like where he's like, I will never do anything that loose again. Like that. I, yeah, it taught me discipline to make a movie in such a bizarre way. But also like as much as he tries to fucking write off how much he cares about doing the music and the editing and the script and all that sort of shit. It's the one area in which he kind of like shows his ass, which is just like the guy just does love having control over his stories. Like he is a holistic thinker about all aspects of this. Mm-hmm. And he might say, well, I can't afford to hire someone else to fucking do it. But it's also like he prefers that all of that's under his purview. There's a little bit of the Soderbergh thing there where it's like, yeah. if I take on six jobs, I know I can make the movie cheaper and I'll get everyone out of my fucking hair. And one way or the other, it's going to end up the way I want it. Absolutely. I'm trying to figure out what the. F- what are you trying to figure out, Chris? No, the final production number. I guess it was $60,000 60K, in total. Yeah, is the site right. budget. Yes. It went uh, from six right. to went, 60. I think it started at like 1,000, right? And it becomes 60. I mean, honestly, it's one of those things where you're like, you're both like, this costs $60,000. And also you're like, how the fuck did they make this for 60,000? You know, it both yes. looks cheap, but also you're like, I mean, knowing what it's like at the time, you have to buy cam- rent cameras and buy film and all like, that's it's expensive. Yeah, sure. And you compare this to shit like Plan 9 from Outer Space, like 20 years earlier, you know, and this certainly looks a lot more accomplished than that. I mean, this movie does like the, the alien uh, lineage is is very obvious in this, right? Like the whole blue Definitely. collar, like we're sending grunts to space and they're having to take the shitty jobs and the like kind of like nihilistic approach to like the relationship to the company and just like how human life is just like it, it, it's like uh, spendable. You know what I'm, I'm trying to say? Like it's like, well, yeah. And, and the ship voice and their relationship to it is so much more similar to me than what ends up happening with mother in the alien films than Hal, which is ostensibly what they're riffing on, you know, right. like how it really feels like Hal has a mind and a perspective and an ethos of his own. This voice has the sort of like cruel indifference of mother where it's just like you're a bug you don't matter my my like commands are to just get this fucking done uh you're expendable um what was the other thing i was gonna say oh but the other thing the other thing with this and like it's interesting he doesn't come on to star wars until post but lucas clearly had seen this movie and was impressed by him and this feels like maybe this was the first example of like dirty used worn sci-fi you know which is the thing that star wars like revolutionizes on that kind of scale that execution uh, obviously that level of like mainstream success but just even the fact that they have such a limited budget and such limited resources and like obannon and carpenter are 
themselves physically making most of these sets by hand, right? Uh, a carpenter's carpentry uh, at work. Um, it is so telling that rather than like trying to make a fucking forbidden planet ship on a $6,000 budget, their approach is this ship should suck. It should be depressing and drab, you know? Oh my God. The, the blocking of them in that control like the panel. opening shot going through them is like, I don't really know how you do that. That's like, the, like it's such a good opening shot because I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. How are they blocking this? It's so good. Yeah, that is like they're, so funny and effective. Sorry, David. Go. No, no, I can't. You're absolutely, I just agree with you. And and their banter, they're like resigned. What's the line Griffin wanted? The, the, the backup, but don't talk you to me. You want to name basically. the star. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's one of the things that I just like <laughs> shriek at. It's so yes. fun. It's just like like these are people in space who absolutely don't care about space. And it's just yeah. It's uh, super funny. Right. It's just yeah. like they signed up for this job and they regret it. You know, it's like one of them didn't even sign up for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one of them literally just put on the suit and then they couldn't he couldn't, couldn't in get time it get it to convince them or whatever. Like that's just a funny idea, too. I don't know. Yeah. God. Yeah. This thing is it's great. also it's also funny that this absolute shit ship filled with bored like technicians who don't like have the who are low status is blowing up whole planets like that. It, it is so unimaginably <laughs> destructive that like in a Marvel movie, we would have to assemble the fucking Avengers to deal with these guys. They're, they're blowing up into, and instead they're just like, all right bombs away cool let's get out and they're of like here. oh there's a there's signs of intelligent life it's like i don't want a planet with so i don't care that there's intelligent life on this planet give me something i can blow up like, but it's also <laughs> just like like contract like deforestation you know it's yeah, like it's, they're doing this job that they know is inhumane but for whatever reason this has just become like an accepted evil in the world and it's just methodically done without any thought i'm trying to figure out where i read this um because I, I want to give credit to whoever made this observation or this connection. But like the helmets in the movie, right, when the guys actually leave the ship are a retrofitting of this very popular toy uh, a kids space helmet at the time. It was like a very popular product uh, dress up for kids in like the post space race era. And so it's adults wearing these helmets that they've tried to class up that are a size too small to fit onto them. Oh, my God. And some critic I read made the point that it's like even that, which is like on its face, just a reality of their limitations ends up leading this like power to the movie of like it. it they're so irrelevant that their suits don't even fit them correctly, you know? Yeah. They're like yeah. uncomfortable doing the thing they're supposed to be doing. There's nothing glamorous about yeah. it. I love their little bubble at the top of the ship. Yeah. Talby, Talby's bubble. I mean, yeah, I like that you have kind of these very clear profiles of these dudes, too, even though they're all kind of uniformly depressed and like dysfunctional. But like you do have the like guy who's kind of gone space crazy up and up in the cockpit and like is kind of the more cosmic brain. I mean, I love those conversations up in the cockpit where they're just like where you know where they plant the surfing seed but it's just at the time it just seems like two guys just shooting the shit in like space and um talking about asteroids and stuff i don't know the blonde guy with the mustache who's kind of the aggro is that, one is that ben I, well <laughs> these are all my different personalities this truly this is like my multiplicity <laughs> um but he is like very um He's that very much boiler. doing my favorite thing. Boiler. What's that? Oh, right. Of course. Boiler. boiler is his name. Yes. Smoking like backwoods on a spaceship. Come on. You know, like what? This is so great. Uh, and then the gun that he's using, that space like ray gun, uh, looks great. Like um, the lasers on this look great. You know, man, this is like I would love to like go to like a stoner screening of this movie. Oh, yeah. Man. It's so fun. I mean, I, I was, I was hey. thinking about the context of their mission and like how we find out about it. And I just remember the whole opening part where you have the kind of transition from back on Earth. Um, and I'm thinking back on that now. I'm like, how does nobody go into this movie not realizing it's a comedy from it's the job? Odd. That like that yeah. part is so absurdist. 
It's very, it's very like airplane. It's very uh, kind of deadpan absurdist. Um, and then, I mean, it doesn't, it's not necessarily the tone of the rest of the movie, but it's just like obviously setting up the fact that this is a, a silly, like pointless mission. That's just like kind of depressing and mind numbing. And like the kind of, you know, like, Oh yeah, we're watching it all on TV back home. We had a memorial for your friend who died. Like, um, Oh, sorry about the radiation. Like, you know, it's just, I, I, I don't know how you like, I don't know how anybody watched this. It was like, oh, this must be for real. <laughs> it's also fascinating that like Dan O'Bannon doesn't have an active hand in Aliens with a dollar sign, but this open feels so much like the Riser character in Alien and that yes. whole sort of role yeah. that the first Alien doesn't have of like, oh, this is what the like smug company officials are like. Even just the fact that it's communicated over the screen and whatever. And you also, I know it's not like Aliens created this but that you have the fucking knife game with the hand you know that that's like, another thing i just yelp at when he pokes himself in the hand but it's just like a gentle poke it's yes. not like he does like grievous damage to his hand no, it's, it's just, just like, like he can't do the trick everything <laughs> in this movie is kind of just like a minor inconvenience you know it's like people who just hate their day job except the problem is their day job is also their entire lifestyle like they have now gotten themselves stuck in this all consuming suck. It's very, and there's the whole, like they're sleeping in, I don't know what the room is, but it's not their bunk and they've been using the bunk for something else. And it just feels like, that's the part where you're like, oh yeah, this was made by college kids. Cause it just truly feels like, oh, here are four men who like don't know how to take care of themselves and are like not going to put in the effort to get a better sleeping situation for themselves. They're just going to live in squalor on mattresses with like, like food junk everywhere on the floor like it's just so they when you open the door to that room it's just like ah college <laughs> well and it's also hilarious that it's train like spotting dad is gone right because like the the leader he got electrocuted something happened to him right you think he's dead we'll get to that he's later stuck in cryo sleep which right. is like a truly like a cosmic like tragedy like i'm like i saw that and it's like hilarious but also like terrifying yeah. it's like basically like tripping and never like coming out of it or something you know uh yeah like that you know? unsettled me yeah <laughs> you truly that. you know yeah. like that's what it like it feels like um but wait i forgot what i was saying now fuck that's very appropriate yeah damn it's yeah. very <laughs> accurate i would say i i also love that the the beach ball like is not an invader it is <laughs> this creature that they've kept on the shit around is like a mascot and in his like dialogue before the thing starts lashing out at him he's even acknowledging like this was stupid i never should have let you stay like everyone told me this was wrong like it's no, like he says we needed a mascot which yeah. makes me laugh so right, yeah. hard that but is like, like something i would say and then regret <laughs> totally but that, right that whole like fucking <laughs> set piece which is like the proto like type for all of alien is sort of has the energy of like, we let this dude crash on our couch for too long and everyone told me he was going to be a problem. And now I'm finally like fucking having to deal with it. It's absolutely, yeah, Ben, you would like show up to the office with like a duck or whatever and be like, it's the blank check duck. <laughs> like, what? You, you don't think this is a good idea? <laughs> yeah, it's cut to you two months later, it stinks like duck. It's like attacking you with its <laughs> with its webbed feet. <laughs> yeah, g guests are coming in, and we're like, "We're s sorry about the duck smell." Um, duck piss. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. We finally, find out what it, what what does duck piss smell like? Well, finally, now. <sighs> um, but I remember what I was saying. So the captain, though, the captain's gone. You get a lot of great jokes where. Um, uh, O'Banion, I forget the character. He's being like, I want to make back. sure pin back. He was, he wants to make sure that on the record, it made him uncomfortable that he sat next to him when that happened. I feel like he keeps going back to that, like interrupting, like, you know, official like recordings and what have you. Uh, but the fact that the captain is gone and it's just now the like, you know, next in command who like has given up. Like, I just yeah. I think that setup is so great. It's really funny. I, I was uh, not surprised to see that the creators of Red Dwarf like cited yes. this as an ultimate Absolutely. influence. Uh, yeah. Doug Naylor in particular. But like I love Red Dwarf and kept thinking about it during this as like I feel like every 
a couple of years, there's like a hot spec script going around, either as a pilot or feature or both, where someone's trying to crack the space comedy and yeah. not the sci-fi comedy, but like, can you make the people driving each other crazy on a spaceship comedy? Because it feels like that's so rife for like interpersonal tension comedy. And it never works. Most of them don't get made. A lot of times the pilots are shot, reshot, and never make it onto air. And then like, you know, uh, the fucking, uh, what's it called? The Orville is like 15 years of networks trying to figure out a way to do a big spaceship comedy. And then their solution was just do Star Trek and maybe also make it not a comedy. Yeah. Right, do Star Trek and occasionally there's a joke. Red Dwarf is like the one show that cracked this. And and, yes. uh, and this movie is the one movie that kind of cracked it of like, this is the type of comedy you need to do from just like four people who resent each other stuck in like a vast nothingness for eternity. The thing with Red Dwarf that right is the LOL nothing matters vibe. Obviously, Red Dwarf manages also to stretch that into a sort of semi-functional space universe that makes sense. You know, it has plot. Sure, it has sure. narrative. It, it has a more expansive... Right. sci-fi reach yes but it, it has the attitude uh of a dark star that is very hard to make dramatically exciting obviously because and, and also that there's no boss like the lack of leader where it's just yeah. like here are a collection of characters who should not be at the center of this story the anchor the hero is gone and now these people are just kind of fucking stuck and it's like odd couple comedy to the nth degree where the stakes are so goddamn high and there's just no other life well, like, speaking of Claire Denis, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I hadn't seen this, I think, since High Life. And I, mm -hmm. I mean, one thing about the, doing the com comedic version of this is like, what level of effects do you, do you need to pull off a comedic tone? Yeah. Like, it, I don't think it can be so bad that it's um, just a joke because that joke will wear thin very quick. Like, you have to convince people a little bit of something but it also like if it's too slick i don't know that maybe I, yeah. I i think that's a mistake that people make a lot is they think it has to look like the real thing at yeah. a level that then becomes distracting and also on a production from a production standpoint day-to-day -day filming affects performance in a way that drains comedy maybe but i mean i think that Claire Denis maybe made the inverse mistake. I don't know if I'm in the minority on that, but like that's that's one like huge miscalculation as far as like what's the level of effects we need to pull this off? Obviously, that's not a comedy, but like I laughed. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I love that movie. I gotta watch it again. I've seen it twice. It's it's a tough balance. Like it yeah. it, it mm -hmm. is hard to know how much you need to comply with like. The, the audience's expectations of sci-fi films. Yeah, that movie's wild. I actually went to a screening at BAM and Claire Denis and Bob were there. Oh. And he vaped. Bob. He, Bob. He, he, Are you talking about Bob Pattinson? Yeah. Bob. <laughs> what do you mean? Bob. I don't think anyone. Yeah, Bob well, was there. What, I, I don't know. I actually don't know what Robert, Robert Pattinson Pattinson's. goes by. That's how I know him. Yeah. I don't know. but Folks, um, you, you need to understand Ben did not say that with any glint in his eye. There was no smirk on his face. That was not pitched as a joke that he was waiting for us to react to. Yeah, he wasn't like, oh, right. Yeah. I was like, Weinstein? Yeah, I, I truly, <laughs> all three of us were just taken aback doing the math on who he could be talking about. Bob. Bob Pattinson. Well, anyway, he was Bobby vaping P. the whole time. I mean... You know, you guys probably all have a close personal relationship to Bob Benson now that you've done the whole Twilight series. Oh, oh his yeah. art bulbous art, yeah. Yeah. What What are the things we want to talk about with this movie? I also, like, I think the thing that's maybe the most directly winky and not just sort of sad sack and dry on this is the bomb conversation yeah, bomb with the computer. Right. But I still love it. And I love, whoever does the voice of the computer is just like, pitch perfect it's so good uh it, it's it's mostly carpenter right uh let me double yeah no no sorry mostly o'bannon is the is the bombs yeah o'bannon 
is credited with two separate names as each as bomb 19 and bomb 20 but it, it's a band no but i mean the computer the like the 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 main system of the the woman's voice oh that that oh the, the lady yeah that's uh, her yeah, name is cookie, cookie nap. nap one of the all-time great names yeah cookie nap cookie nap Oh man. We've all taken cookie naps. K N A P P. And yes, she is the voice of the computer in this. And then most of her credits after this World of Sexual Fantasy Assistant to Director, Phantasm Comes Again, Production Assistant, Can't Buy Me Love, the Patrick Dempsey movie, Studio Teacher. Then she's like a studio teacher. But the, but then. She she goes from being assistant on porny movies to being like on set teacher to minor actors. And then on a movie called Bodies Rest in Motion, she's credited as welfare worker. Wow. Yeah, she I'm reading her obituary. Yeah, she was, uh, you know, an interior decorator at some point. She just turned into a teacher. She worked in a lot of yeah. movies that are not on her IMDb. Seems like she one should of those have people been Siri. Is- like I think I think her voice she is should have so been good. Siri. She should have been Siri. But on the on the subject of like incels and dudes in the seventies reading Playboy, uh, getting into film school and stuff like that, and just yes. the general t- and how that feeds the general tenor of this film. Like, there's just something so. I mean, I know that like it's sort of groany or creaky to have like the sexy computer voice, but there's something so self parodic about it in this instance because it's just like these absolute foul humans who yes. still have this like passive woman's voice that's like coddling them and like being like are you sure you want to do that <laughs> and like um and just like being the most pliant pleasant uh kind of mommy voice in the ship to these absolute dirtbags i don't know i just it's very funny to me i love it um <laughs> i just want to connect these dots now because i just uh, figured this out. Cookie Knapp was married to Douglas Knapp, who was a USC compatriot of uh, Carpenter and O'Bannon and was the cinematographer on this, as well as Assault on Precinct 13, uh, and then became uh, like camera operator, second unit for Escape for New York, best boy on Badlands, uh, camera operator on Frankenweenie and Beetlejuice and Coming to America. Um, he shot a lot the, of uh, Star Trek Voyager episodes later in his life. He, yes. I yes. was going to bring up Voyager, actually, when you were talking. <laughs> he was a uh, director of photography on a lot of Voyager and camera operator on even more of Voyager. See, the, the six degrees of this movie and and all space things. It's uh it, it is fascinating how it's not even that it's like, oh, this is the thing that inspires everyone. It's like, this is the thing where five people then branch out and make the changes. Like, yeah. this is their dry run, and then they all go out and splinter off, and everyone takes their specialty and then, like, seeds it throughout the industry. But they also, like, in addition, obviously, to some other key players, like, kind of build what sci-fi looks like for the next totally. several decades. Yes, like, yes. Um. Yeah, it's yeah, and there's so that, tendrils like, there's th- everywhere. And that's why there's some like, even though there are obviously parts of this movie that are a little sloppy, uh, some fat that could be cut. Like, I, it's still so precious to me for that reason. Like, it's just it feels like an actually watchable glimpse into that. Like, I think a lot of yeah. things like that that hold that position are actually rather unwatchable. Um, I wish I could come up with some, some specific examples right now. But like, but this. Like, I like this movie better than Assault on Basin 13. <laughs> that's, that's actually a wild take, I would say. That's a close to a wild take. Yeah, I, I, I want to watch this movie more than that. And sure. I actually rewatched I that. that recently because this mini series was coming up. And I was like, oh, I haven't watched that in quite a while. And like, I don't know. It's just like, well, it's also like, I, as I said, I like Funny Carpenter best. Um, yeah, right. And... So I feel like he's not funny Carpenter. I'm also like Halloween is not my favorite Carpenter by a long shot. Like once he starts being funny and absurdist again, then I'm I'm back in on it. Uh, like those are my favorites. So but, you like, like uh, big, big trouble in Little China. You said they obviously. Live. Yeah, they live. Yeah, right. They yeah. live. That, I mean, the right. thing is like the thing has plenty of comedy. In oh, too. Like is, I oh, yeah. can't wait to talk the thing. The, the thing is the movie in 
his filmography that feels like the natural evolution of this in a lot of ways where he's dealing yeah. with a lot of the same themes. Yeah. And also like I, another thing I was thinking, I was like, Kurt, Kurt Russell feels like the perfection, the, the, the diamond like fusing yes. of all the dudes in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, like, absolutely. Like you could imagine a young Kurt Russell just being one of the dudes on the ship, like facial hair and everything. And it's that same tone. It's that same, like that. Yeah. The like, <laughs> don't bother me. Like about the naming the star just feels like something that Russell could have delivered. Um, right. Like the guys are all very good in this. We should also mention that Carpenter dubs over one of the guys that. Uh, Which one does he dub over? Uh, what's his name? Trilby? Uh, uh, Talby. Oh, Talby. Talby. Trilby. Yes. <laughs> Talby. Yeah. Oh, the guy in the cockpit. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, Carpenter dubbed funny. over his whole uh, performance. I mean, I imagine most of this was dubbed over anyway, but uh, but that, you know, they're like, I'm going into it. But the movie, into- <laughs> the movie has an interesting energy as a byproduct of the fact that it does not have any movie star juice in it. And like, right. obviously, like, you know, he works his way up to finding Kurt Russell, right? Like finding the perfect avatar for his on-screen sensibility. Yeah. But I mean, even something like comparing this to the first Evil Dead, where you're like, oh, like Sam Raimi was lucky that his buddy actually could carry a movie, you know? And you're watching that movie and he's like giving an overqualified performance for that. Yeah. Um, but that's yeah. a movie that makes Bruce Campbell an icon, whereas like the fact that it's just the guys with these kind of low energy performances in this makes the movie the star rather than right. making any kind of one guy the point. Yeah, it very much feels like, oh, these are just my buddies I would have been having a beer with. Like at yeah. the end of the day, but I instead we instead of going to the bar, we like went to go make a movie. <laughs> well, well, and like aside from the other shit we were talking about, Dan O'Bannon, his legacy was that he was this like very riled up, paranoid, sort of like constantly monologuing dude who always had like a loaded gun near him. Slept with a gun under his pillow type thing, right? Slept on a pillow made of guns. Probably right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, as we said, Carpenter and O'Bannon did not get along. Uh, making this movie they do not like exit this experience being like all right what are we doing next uh yeah carpenter sided with harris right with the the producer guy uh, no uh, that, that that is i don't think that's true because famously uh carpenter put in the movie a computer screen no. flash saying fuck you harris what nope. No, Ob- O'Bannon did that. O'Bannon Carpenter. did that. O'Bannon Weird. hated Harris. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, and then, you know, Harris w- works with him on Eyes of Laura Mars, which is like one of the first screenplays that Carpenter sells when he's like trying to make money in Hollywood yes. or whatever. Like mm-hmm. yeah. Harris sticks with him. But it came down to basically like Carpenter was willing to play ball with certain right. creative like requests that were coming in. Right. And O'Bannon was just being difficult and just basically was like, refusing to to play the game that you very much have to and so i think that is like kind of where right right and that's kind of where their like uh the tension started to grow from there basically yeah and like carpenter's whole thing was obviously that he wanted this to be a calling card movie and that he thought people would see it and then offer him films which didn't happen but he got an agent off of this and so he kind of like pragmatically just went like fuck i'll just write scripts and so it was Eyes of Laura Mars, what became Eyes of Laura Mars, what became Escape from New York. And then there was a third movie that was a Western that Elvis Presley and John Wayne were supposed to do together that never happened, which is Whoa. a fascinating reality to consider. Yeah. Um, but yeah, between this and Halloween, I think he obviously didn't give up on directing, but he was kind of like, I guess this is how I need to make my get my foot in the door is just selling enough scripts until someone lets me make my own thing again. Okay. I have a, I have a final thought I'd like to share about this movie. That is something that we haven't discussed as of yet. Okay. Take us home. The music. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we have that country song. Yes. Which is Which I love. Yeah. It's so funny. And it, it's so funny. It's so funny to have it be like the lead in song for your sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. Movie. Sets the tone quite well. Again, who would watch the opening of this movie and not realize it's a comedy between that song and the opening transmission? It's just... Especially the ending when he's fucking surfing to Benson, Arizona. (laughs) Yeah. 
It's so, written by uh, Carpenter and Bill Taylor, yeah. who did the special yeah. effects. Yeah. Yes. Also, I think I, I was just perusing the wiki of this movie that um, there is a town, Benson, Arizona, and there is a star or there is a street in it called Dark Star Lane. Wow. Hey. Cool. That's cool. That must be homage. Yes. But but even the whole the the synth vibe of this movie, like Carpenter kind of stumbled into it by accident as a byproduct of just like we have no time. We have no money. I cannot produce an expansive score. I could play instruments myself or I can get this like newfangled device. And he describes the synthesizer oh God, he so was cool. using for this movie as being controlled by wooden pins. You had to put <laughs> wooden pins in different oh slots God. to modulate the levels of it. And it was just for him like that's the it'll sound fake, but that's the way I can at least get the size of score I want. And then that becomes his definitive style as a composer. Yeah, it, it, it's also funny, Griff. He, well, it just he says he did that in four hours. How the fuck do you like? You're like, you, all right, what yeah. do we do? Put a bunch of pins in there. All right, I'll do a score in four hours. Yeah, get, get out of here. It's wild. What were you gonna say, Ben? I'm sorry. No worries. There's like, there's something to there's something to be said about the sound, and it being like elevator music or Muzak, you know, throughout, and like how. It's it's very funny, and then it, it's like that. That's the entertainment that they get. Whereas, yeah. like yeah. you know, uh, you sometimes you'll get like um, sometimes you'll get like op operatic music and stuff mm -hmm. that maybe feels a little bit more like usual, typical of like what music people listen to in space. Like maybe sometimes it's like rock songs, like in Marvel movies, but like shitty jazz in space. No, but they're they're making fun of two thousand one, like in particular with the opera shit, right? Sure, yeah. but there is that that is the funniest thing to me when they're listening to the rock music in the cockpit and they're all just like head banging. It's so <laughs> well, it's like also the just most like, high energy moment of the entire movie. <laughs> but also, it's like it's realistic where you're just like these dudes, just like stuck in isolation doing grunt work, aren't going to listen to fucking like highfalutin classical music just because it makes right. the imagery look poetic. You know, that's not what they would be playing, or yeah. even have a choice of something they like. Sure. Yeah, it feels like I think like the computer plays the ele elevator music and they have their like recreational music. Yeah, <laughs> that she turns off at some point. Uh, it is fascinating to me that these multiple different cuts he did, like the first one O'Bannon did was for Laserdisc. And then on DVD, he did a, a, a third cut. And then on Blu-ray, they've restored it only to the theatrical cut. But I read reviews of both the DVD and the Laserdisc cut where people said, like, they're incoherent. Like, it, <laughs> like, he was like, look, I'm just taking out this additional stuff that was never meant to be in it. And people are like, it doesn't make sense. You cannot. It is not a functional version of this movie. I would assume this is also sort of later, even crazier Dan O'Bannon, right? Who's yes. like, all right, let me roll up my sleeves. I'm sure I can fix this thing. And it's like. <laughs> completely bananas. I mean, it is like what you were saying about Bob Gale, except it's like you have the money from Alien, right? You have the passion to protect Dark Star. Like it's such a, it's such a, like he's set up. Obviously, it's not like he's struggling, but the thing he's fixated on is this ex extended student film. He could like, have been the Bob Gale to Alien if he wanted. Like yeah. he could have been the guy yes, who does the yes. fucking rounds for Alien, and instead he's like. I need vindication for this student And film. it's like quite the opposite. Like he doesn't work on any other alien except like he's like a consultant or something on Alien versus Predator. Like, like that's the one he hops back on for. It's right. hilarious. <laughs> and I, I imagine that was a combination of both. That movie had like such toxic buzz that they wanted to like make good with the fans. And also he probably was like, I don't know, I want to buy a boat. I'm ready to like take this job now. Well, he has like a, a just a handful of huge hits that I'm sure just like kept him afloat for the most part total because recall, he wrote Total obviously. Recall. Right, like, right. right. Yep. And I forget what there's something else. Revenge but yeah. of the Living Dead. Return of the Living Dead was like a big VHS movie. You know, I'm sure that was profitable for him. But also like any time they went to the alien well for any reason, the guy got a check. Yeah. Yes. Guys, I just had a great time Google Street viewing down Dark Star Road. I really recommend it. 
Really? Uh, Take a in, look. In Benson, Arizona. It's just like empty. Wait, like, share your screen. Blast it. Oh, what the fuck? Uh, all right, let me figure that out. Wait, what part of screen? Arizona is Benson in? Is it northern and southern? Uh, let's find out. I have to zoom out here because, of course, I know so much about Arizona. It looks like it's southern. It's sort of probably like, you know, like 30 miles out of Tucson or something. Like it's near the border, near the Mexico border. Griff, do you want to get the lyrics and sing while we while we go on the street view? <laughs> do you want to do that? I don't know if, if the lyrics are findable, but I want to say a thing I was just thinking about. So I'm looking here, right? Uh, at Dark Star uh, Road. Oh. Ooh. All right. Okay, wait. Let's, but let me, let me, this is on the highway. It's greener than I then, would expect. Wait, here, I want to get. Oh, it's on the 10. The no, it's off the 10. So wait, let, it's me, off the let 10. me. Okay, here we go. So here's Dark Star right. Road. Well, okay. Well, when you, when you zoom in even more, it looks like there's like one property off of that road. That's what I, I was trying to I drove so through Griff. Benson last summer. Yeah, I was. I was trying to figure this out, Griff, because look here, here's there's a little line of mailboxes, right? Oh, so that wow. is, that that presumes like there's some properties. Cause I was trying to think, like, yeah, could we like, you know, get a compound on Dark Star Road? Well, you know, like uh, David, this is what I was gonna suggest. We're starting to like look into getting now that you know the pandemic is easing up, getting a, a studio, uh blank check uh, offices where we can record the show. We were thinking, compound, oh, do we go downtown? Compound. Yeah. What if we just go fucking compound Benson, Arizona? Get yeah, go through Dan O'Bannon, have, sleep with guns them. under yeah. our pillows. Yeah, <laughs> Blank Check Productions on Dark Star Road in Benson, Arizona. That would Arizona. be a killer address to have, though. Yeah. For your, at least, like, be. you could maybe get a post office box on Dark yeah. Star Yeah, get, get mail forwarded from there or whatever. Like, look, is that a yeah. person? No, that's just a weird plant, maybe. Weird. This is turning into like a <laughs> like a horror movie. Yeah, itself. I was going to say, like, we're, we're going to zoom in. On this. <laughs> See, so I, find, I, find, I find a murder on Dark Star Road and we're like, shit, when was this taken? Or we see like you standing on the side of the road, but your eyes are entirely <laughs> white. <laughs> it's like, wait, this is from 2023? I don't know. And understand. then all of our faces on the Zoom go blurry. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> uh, anyway, pretty cool. Look, see, here's a property. Oh, there, oh, there it is. Okay. Is, that, is it for sale? Yeah. This, let, is, this is 2016. Look at, street uh, easy. Uh, beware Looks of the like dog. It's like a double wide. All you guys need is a nice little double wide on, on, on Dark, uh, Dark Star Road. And if we're being if we're being responsible, David, blank check recording studio should have a beware the dog sign on the door. That's (laughs) uh, that's true. That's actually a good point. All right, all right. Uh, David, Mm -hmm. can you see me? No. Where'd you go? Well, I used a little IP van. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yeah, this is a new sponsor yeah. for the show. It's you made gotten me, your IP varnish. It's given me superpowers. And you've gotten your IP vanish. Yep, I vanished. So what is IP vanish? It's a virtual private network. Mm. It's a VPN for sure. That's okay. why I like to call because I'm a good friend with it. Right. It's a super important tool. It helps you safely browse the internet. You can use it on your computers, your, well, tablets, your tablets, your phone. Even like, it's like a fire stick or streaming media. Right. Even anything you're using on your television. When All you the use a VPN, exactly. Yes. Every single little piece of it is encrypted. What you're doing on the internet is nobody's, nobody's business but Absolutely. yours. Yeah. IP Vanish helps you remain anonymous and secure on the internet. Whatever it is you're doing, we're now, not judging. Griff, listen yeah. up. The uh-huh. listeners listening. of our show can get 65% off. That's $349 for the first month or $31.49 for the year. That's incredible. That's incredible. 65% off. It's an incredible deal. And David, I, I look shocked. Like, I look impressed, but you can't see it because I use the IP Vanish and I'm invisible. I, I can't see a single thing you're I'm doing. I'm invisible. But that's fine because... Here's some other stuff you got with IP mm-hmm. Vanish. Anonymous IP addresses, so it can't be tracked by on the web. Huge. You're circumventing online censorship. Mm-hmm. They've got 1,500 servers in 70 locations. That's worldwide. They have protection when using public Wi-Fi. All your data is encrypted. No mm-hmm. one can snoop on you. Mm-hmm. And 24-7 support. Email them, chat with them, call them. They're there to help. Go to ipvanish.com slash check to claim your 65% savings. They have plans starting just three forty nine dollars yeah. or thirty one forty nine dollars a year. Yep. This is the time to sign up. And look, if you're a blank check listener, just want to say, you can connect a few dots. Your IP Vanish is a great way if you're trying to watch things on streaming services in different countries. Sometimes that's going to be helpful for you. Listen, with our discount and their current promotional offerings, you can get a VPN for 65% off the usual offering. IP Vanish is the best of the best. Mm. It's rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot. That's with more than 6,000 reviews. 
Okay, so ipvanish.com slash check. Get that deal. Three forty nine a month really it's is. It's really cheap. It's very cheap. It's a good number. David. What? I'm still invisible. You're invisible. You vanished. I vanished. Let's play the box office game unless, right, Griff, anything else you want to say? Uh, no, you uh, pull up the box office game and I'm going to try to figure out how much that house costs on Dark Side Road. Sure. I would get, hit up Zillow. Maybe even if there was like a billboard. Hey, you like John Carpenter? Oh, Check out this podcast. Oh, that yeah. would be amazing. I did not see a billboard on my quick tour, but I, it would be funny if right we like paid 800 bucks for a billboard ad. And we decided for the first Arizona. time to advertise our show. And that's what we do. In the middle of nowhere, Arizona. <laughs> yeah. All right, Griffin, the box office for this. Now that I have my magic Kindle book with the box office from every year ever, we're going to do uh-huh. this oh film. Technically, it was released in Los Angeles on January 16th, 1975. So the box office for that weekend. So it's the, you know, kind of the tail end of Christmas 74 is mm-hmm. what we've got here. Number one, I think is a movie. My guess is this is one of your favorite directors. I think you really like this movie. It's a, a mystery, a murder mystery. Is it the, the long kiss goodbye? No, the long kiss goodbye. Oh, well, what am I talking about? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm combining the long kiss goodnight and the long goodbye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, no. Who, who's, who's one of your favorite directors, Griff? Well, that's why I was guessing Altman, but it's not. Right. No, 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 no. Uh, Ashby. No. Cassavetes. No. I'm thinking of my big 70s guys. Yeah. Did I put him in the March Madness bracket? I don't think he did because his career is like 80 movies or whatever. Like he's oh, Lumet, got too many Lumet, movies. Lumet. Lumet. Sydney Lumet. Okay. Uh, it's not Murder on the Orient Express, is it? It no. sure is. It sure is. A hit. Yes. Hong Kong. Beep, beep. Choo, choo. I love that movie. I think that movie is a little underrated. I think it's just such fucking Cracker Jack entertainment. It is very fun. That movie. Fun. Fun. Ridiculous. Star laden. Albert Finney. Yeah. Having, having, uh, you know, a nice big hammy sandwich. Yeah. Finney being like younger than all of us playing Poirot. Uh, just a blast. Murder on the Orient Express is number one at the box office in its eighth week of release. A, a hit. Rules. I guess. Rules. Yeah. Big fucking splashy hit. Yeah. Number two is a, a disaster film. There are two disaster films. This is kind of mm. this is the, the peak of the mm-hmm, yeah exactly yeah. the air. This is the like Poseidon's. this is probably the most famous of that. Maybe well, Poseidon Adventure, I guess, is probably the most. So this is probably is the it second air, most airport ta- tower. No, it's famous for its billing. It, it, I, I think Emily guessed it. Towering Inferno. Towering Inferno. It's the Towering yeah. Inferno. Yes. Yeah. Um, which uh, diagonal famous, billing. Right, exactly. Uh, Newman is second, but higher than McQueen, so everyone can be happy or whatever. Have never seen the Towering Inferno. I never have either. I, haven't I tried. Either. I tried to brush up on all of the Irwin Allen movies recently for uh, the sake of uh, uh, trivia, which made me wonder if I should watch them all. I have always put them in a pile in my mind of like these are movies that will only have interest as curios. They will not have entertainment value in present day. I feel like that's a, that's a Patreon series for you guys, honestly. Ooh. Ooh. That would be super fun. That would also get me to watch them because I think I've only seen Poseidon Adventure. Irwin, Irwin Allen movies. Well, here's the thing though, Griffin. It's two hours and 45 minutes long. That's the other thing. Like, These movies are like so like overstuck. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just funny to think like for pre Star Wars, like, you know, that's the sort of like Hollywood's like, well, what you what you need is you need like a building or a boat or a place and it's uh, it's on fire. Yeah. And we just load it up with stars. You need 20 actors between the age of 40 and 78. That's the thing as well. Like the Murder on the Orient Express, this movie and another movie, they have those posters where there's just the sort of Marvel Comics like box of faces. Yeah, like so many faces. That's what I was going to say, though. It feels like an interesting first swing at like what like the four quadrant entertainment that Marvel would become where you just have like somebody for everybody in this cast of thousands and a bunch of spectacle and it's long as hell. It's too long. It just feels like right the first run of that style of entertainment. Okay. So that's number two. Number three is 1974's best picture. 1974's best picture is not Rocky. Rocky 75, right? 
70, 76. Uh, Ruck, is it 76, I believe? Yeah. Okay, 74. Ah, fuck, why am I not thinking about this? It's not French Connection? Nope. Uh, uh, 75. 71. Yeah. Sorry, 71. Uh, Midnight Cowboys, 70. Mm-hmm. Is Freakin even on your... Is is that even possible? Oh, we've put him... He's we, the original blank check guy. Yeah, we've he's, talked he's about him. Yeah. Okay. Sorcerer is like the original blank check. Not, yeah. not original, original, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Process of elimination. If I tell you something else about it, you'll just know what it is. If you tell me anything else about it, I'll know what it pretty is. Pretty much, pretty much. Um, it's a big hit. It wins Best Picture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't tell me genre, right? Uh, crime. Fuck, why am I not thinking of what this is? Because it's too oh, obvious. Oh, oh, it's The Godfather. You nope. fucking dummy. No. Nope. Nope. That's 72. It's not The Godfather. It's not French Connection. What's another film about crime that won Best Picture? Here's a hint. It's really related to the film The Godfather. Uh, it's been fucking moron. It's called The Godfather <laughs> Part 2. Because <laughs> my next clue would have been like, it's, I believe it's the first sequel to win, but then it's yeah. like, well, you know, right. You know, you know, you know what that is. Uh, yes, it is. Godfather, the Godfather part, part, two. part two, which popular and quite good. in my yeah, big hit successful film. Big Wait, hit. Part two what? came out first. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. They switched yeah. the order. Yeah. They yeah. switched the order. <laughs> they pulled yeah, and then pulled part the one was like a black widow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. They were a relevant movie about some dead characters. Uh, okay, so Godfather Part Three is just chilling out. Obviously, you know it's 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 the Godfather Part I Two. Said Sorry, two. No, I said three. Oh so. my god, we're uh, so I confused know, right now. Get out of it's- here! Number four at the box office is a movie I don't know uh, particularly well. I've sort of heard of it. Uh, it's an indie movie, true indie movie um, about like a sheriff out for blood. Because his wife got killed tall? by drifters. Mm. No, but you've got, you know, you, you, yes, like you know, those kinds of vibes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no way. Well, maybe it's you not have Billy. heard of it. It's not Billy Jack. Obviously. No, not Billy Jack. Um, but it's in that walking tall Billy Jack sort of vein. Let me read you the tagline for this. It was the fall of '54, a time when laughing was easy, and they and laugh they did. Until they crossed capital T, the capital L line. So that's sort of a hint. Is there. the line part the of the line. title? It is, it is. But that's a pretty good tagline, right? Laughing was easy and laugh they did until they crossed the line. Also, it's a period piece? It is. It's set in the 50s, set in 1950s Georgia. The uh, movie the is called is, The Line? Oh, no. No, it's called Macon County Line. Ah, uh, okay. Is there anything that's more of a bummer than 70s era, 50s nostalgia? No, it's <laughs> yeah, right. weird. <laughs> that's like us making movies about the 2000s. Well, it looks like this movie is kind of like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre type movie where it's sort of like, this is quote unquote based on a true story. And it's sort of like a, you know, gritty, uh, violent movie that's like very, very vaguely. It's like, it's like a drive-in movie, like a big, you know, uh, grindhouse Sounds kind of fun. Uh, Emily, to your point, it remains absolutely absurd when you think about the fact that Happy Days premiered in 1974 and yeah. the chronology of the show starts in like 56 or something. Yeah. And you're like, could you imagine if I was like, we need to make a network sitcom about the halcyon days of 2005. But that's what that 70s show was in the 90s. Like, it's like the 20 year cycle. But at least that 70s show is sort of like snarky about it. Happy Days is just literally being like, these were the happy days. <laughs> right. When yes. things were good. <laughs> ah, ah, right. uh, yes. <laughs> I guess it's like the last time that people could tell themselves that about a previous decade of American history. <laughs> Men could <laughs> say A hey, and hit a jukebox. Now, of course, no, oh God, when men could do that. Now, Griffin, number five at the box office. I don't think. This is another Irwin Allen-esque disaster movie. I don't think Irwin Allen actually produced this one. It has a terrific title, which is An Event, dot, dot, dot. The whole, uh, ta- sorry, the whole tagline. <laughs> whole tagline. Um, but it is, it's uh, much like The Towering Inferno, a star-laden 
disaster movie with incredible special effects inspired by the success of movies like airport, you know, it's written by an Mario event? Puzo. No, it's what? not called an event. Wow. Sorry. That's the tagline. I said, title. Oh, I thought stupid. the dead name of the movie was an event, which is I'm sorry. Here. It was I'm sick sorry. as hell. Uh, <laughs> what is it? It's not earthquake. It is earthquake. Hey, which I believe is it that a dam gets the Mulholland Dam, right? Gets uh, blown up at the end. That was like their big special effect. I mean, it collapses. Could they not at least say it was a seismic event? They should have said that. That's a good point. You got Charlton Heston, Ava Gardner, George Kennedy. It is wild how they were like, what are you under 50? Uh, you, you, yeah, the exit signs over there. You're not in the cast of Earthquake. It's also wild that like Mario Puzo writes this fucking like supermarket bestseller book, right? And then gets like a credit for partially adapting his own book to what becomes one of the most beloved movies of all time, one of the most successful movies. And then the rest of his screenwriting career is Earthquake, The Godfather Part Two, Superman, Superman Two, yep. The Cotton Club. Like done. Like it's it's so weird. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's just like the king of hacks. So you got to respect yeah. the guy. Yeah, uh, I don't know. And yeah, like it's, it was so weird that he wrote Superman. Did he like, I know he's not the only person. I guess he's, no, there are four credited writers on Superman. Right, yeah. They, I, I, I was going deep on Superman however long ago. And he was like the big blue chip writer they brought on apparently throughout most of his script because they'd written one and two at the same time. He got credit on both of them. Also, he he fucking won two Oscars, uh, even though I think, you know, Coppola really fucking wrote those screenplays. It's like he got to take home two trophies. Apparently. Yeah. Uh, Tom Mankiewicz said uh, Puzo's script was 550 pages long. <laughs> yeah. And like <laughs> incoherent. I read. Right. Yeah. It was just like horrible. Yeah. Anyway. That's what some other freebie in the bean, young Frankenstein. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. You've got the man with the golden gun on the top 10 there. You've got something called law and disorder. Looking that up with uh, Carol O'Connor and Ernest Borgnine in crime in, in, in crime written 70s. New York City. Two cops have had enough. That's what a law and disorder is about. Holy shit. Griff, just look up the poster for Law and Disorder. Oh, no, I'm looking Please. it up right Please. now. Wow. Please. Wow. <laughs> I swear to God. It's like an oil painting of, of these guys. You got to see this shit. There was the tweet going around this week that went like semi-viral about how like why actors in the 70s were allowed to look like normal people and everyone's too hot now. And this poster is just a great example yes, of that. Where it's just like, like, yeah, put them all on the poster. <laughs> right. It's just like four bags of salami wearing fucking summer clothes. Wait, I, I need to see this. I, I don't know where my phone went. I can't. Look. <laughs> Wait, uh, what's the name of it again? Law and Disorder. Law and Disorder. Law and disorder. Okay. It's an amazing poster. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can get the gist of it. I got a very pixelated yeah, version. Yeah, but looks like yeah, a couple bags of salami is about is about the size of it. <laughs> okay. It looks like a oh, movie that's it. sort of like a comedy version of these cops take the law into their own hands. It's like they do that, and then they're like, "Oh shit, we don't know what to do." You know, like it's like yeah. a like that poster drops on like 1974 era Twitter, and I immediately open a new tab and get on Fandango and see yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> We've talked about it before, but 1974, because you mentioned Young Frankenstein, one of those just uh, uh, year career years that's hard to fathom where Mel Brooks has Young Frankenstein and Blazing Saddles come out within six months of each other. Uh, yes, that, crazy. Cra that's why we have to do Brooks one day. Yeah, and also that, that that gave him such a blank check that he was like, maybe I star in the movies now? And they were like, sure, yeah. <laughs> right. Like he did the Seth MacFarlane thing, except it worked. And people were like, yeah, another Mel Brooks vehicle. You get to be the guy now. We love it. Hey, you know what? It. And we did it. Yeah, that was a fun app. Emily, though, has to go. Yes, we shouldn't. We I already. Yeah, I already have caused enough chaos in your day, but this was fun. All, it's like a group or orchestrated chaos, or at least this the West Coast side of things over here. 
Well, so. it's it. Look, it's going to be absolute chaos when we record uh, the three of us in person again at uh, 2320 West Dark Sire Road in Benson, <laughs> Arizona, which is 728 square feet and currently going for seventy three thousand eight hundred and eighteen. Guys, you can wow. afford this. We can. That's an investment. That's just an investment. I personally would love it if the entire podcast industry post pandemic just all ends up being run out of various compounds in the royal the rural new united states like yes i um i i believe this is the one we were looking at the photo of yes okay but, as right. best i can tell really yeah, so right. yeah yeah it the is only not house for- then on dark star road <laughs> yes apparently um, no, there were four listings on Dark Star Road, but this is the one that seems to match what we were looking at. Um, that having been said, does it said, have a soundproof room? <laughs> uh, I don't know. You gotta find a house on Dark Star Road that has a soundproof room because I'm sure the vibes would be great, and it would also save you a lot when you uh, create your recording studio. Well, yes. But if it has enough property, we could dig a hole and have a soundproof bunker. True. Oh, yeah. uh, and if we're gonna really go full Rogan, we need Century deprivation tanks as well yeah i think you guys should pivot to bunkers i i think it's a great time to go all in on bunkers i've been saying it for years <laughs> i mean they they i'm glad you said it. finally someone else this one is one of four properties listed on zillow off of dark star road and three of them are uh, off the market and one of them sold two years ago for one hundred eighty thousand dollars so 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 things might be trending down on Dark Star Road is what you're saying. Correct. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, still, well, you know, look, I'm seeing that there's an airfield nearby. I'm sure it's a very chill place to be. They they probably have one of those. Um. Oh, so I was just talking to somebody about this. You know, like outside of Marfa, they have this like DEA blimp that mm-hmm. I drove by when I was out driving on the 10 last summer. And it's one of the most alarming things to see. Speaking of weird kind of fake looking sci-fi props it's just this like cartoon looking blimp and i didn't know what it was i felt like i hallucinated it it was like a mirage and then i was talking to friends who were like oh yeah it's a it's a a surveillance blimp run by the dea and there's a lot of that around the border so i'm sure you know you you, you have some fun chill times uh david do you want to uh uh talk us through the link that you just sent so i was just clicking around near dark star road and i found <gasps> a forty five thousand dollar lot on north faded love lane oh, faded it's just, love. this is not love lane <laughs> no, <laughs> not faded love faded lane. love lane no, no it's not a, even it's north <gasps> faded love lane right there's it's seven four pictures acres. It's four acres for forty five thousand dollars. Seven pictures, so it's four acres of land, and the pictures are just of desert. There's some cactuses. There's a picture of what I assume is like a power box that is that's yeah. what it looks like. Yeah. So you can, yes. so you won't be without power. That's to reassure you <laughs> right. that you're not so going to be living off the grid here. Buying this and then just yeah, just sitting next to that power box, kind of plugging my computer in and being like, all right. <laughs> David, this is the perfect bunker spot. There's literally nothing built on this land. We just go down. <laughs> You're right. That script's like, okay, the roof, we're standing on it. We're going down, <laughs> baby. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, perfect end to the episode. Nobody buy my property on Faded Love Lane. No. Uh, David's going to close out of this Zoom, and now I'm just imagining the conversation he's going to have with his wife trying to pitch her on <laughs> Benson, on. Arizona. <laughs> right. God no, too hot for me. I I I need my rain. Um, also, we're gonna get a a blankie from Benson, Arizona, writing us a fifteen page email. Oh my god! <laughs> being like, being like, please, faded though, love I lane. That's not where you want to be. You want to, you know, you don't want to be on the faded scene's love dead lane. on be... faded love. Lane. <laughs> right. I know you guys are probably joking, but here's some overly earnest advice that I wrote in the form of a novel. Um, <laughs> Emily, always a pleasure. Uh, yeah, pleasure's all mine. Great to be back. Uh, great to be in the room with with at least part of the pod. Feels like old times almost, except weirdly at my house. Like, if you're in the same room as Ben, that's the room where it happens. That's the room that matters. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what that song is about, too. Like, 
Um, <laughs> also, I should mention, I forgot to wear it for this recording. I, I forgot that it was my plan until uh, right now, but I uh, recently acquired a really good Welcome to Morrowind shirt. Oh, oh wow. Well, you got yeah, it. Will, I will send the link to the group. Where on earth did you get a Welcome to Marwin shirt? Universal has a rewards website where you can type in codes that come with your Blu-rays and cash them in for prizes. And most of the prizes are Zoom backgrounds, but some of them are like giveaway swag for movies that bombed. So I own a Welcome to Marwin shirt. They also have a Mortal Engines water bottle. Uh, get that People needed for water. Me. That's my next... That's my next. Great. Emily, is there anything you want to plug? You're not on social media. Don't look for you. <laughs> don't look. I'm nowhere. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if I have any. No, I don't have anything to plug. I'm just uh, don't look at business. Me. That's what Emily plugs. Don't uh, look at me. D- don't look at me. Don't think about me. Uh, Listen to past episodes with when Emily was a guest. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Marwin, most importantly. Boom. Uh, I was just going to invoke Iowa Debris, uh, her her incredible Twitter joke of uh, no pronouns don't refer to me ever. Yes, yes. I feel that. Yeah. Listen to past Emily episodes. Listen to Night Call back catalog. Um, <laughs> no way. I truly am no way. I'm zero. It's kind of, it's both incredible and, and sort of a drag. I have nothing you're work, to You're promote. working on secret you got projects. stuff going on. There's stuff going on. Doing yeah. secret things. Someday I'll have so much to promote. You guys will just, yeah. you know. I, well, of yeah. course, we have our Atlantic City movie uh, on the slate that, you know, someday, you know, the big Bambino. The big um, Bambino. We'll oh, get yeah, around to 100%. it. 100%. Also, yeah. I feel like we need to do, if you guys ever come out here for Disneyland or for Galaxy's Edge, we have to do a Vegas trip as a sequel to Atlantic City. I'm going I'm to push for this. Wow. That would be, oh, man. Very fun. Emily, Can you imagine? Emily, uh, <laughs> yes, please. I will also say uh, David has a baby now, so I don't know when that happens, but I will be out in L.A. in just two months. Yeah. Come on. We got to get another am, in yeah. the room. I am very down to do any stupid trips. All right. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll strategize. Put our heads together. Um, um, thank you all for listening. Please remember to... Re- oh, do you have something else you want to say? Sorry. No, I have to... Jump! I'm okay. Like, <laughs> it's yes. We're done. We're done. We're done. My yeah, instincts were correct. Done. He's just gonna do the outro, so uh, I'll clean up quickly. You do your thing. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll be back on in a second, guys. I just need to like send a talk. Please remember, rate, review, subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media. Thank you to Joe Bowen and Pat Rounds for our artwork. Lane Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song. Go to blankies.reddit.com for some real nerdy shit. And go to our Shopify page for some real nerdy merch. And I'm still struggling to remember the correct order of these things since we've updated after being on a recording hiatus for a while. But of course, I have to thank JJ Birch for our research. Uh, Alex Barron, AJ McCann for our editing. One of these days, I will get these things in the correct order again. Yeah. Uh, tune in next week for Assault on Precinct 13. Yes. Trucking along. And should mention, as always, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash blank check for blank check special features where at this point we're riddicking it up or are we on to the mummy now no we're in riddick time uh sorry yes we're we just did pitch black and we're about to post i believe our f9 return to cinemas episode oh the movies are back the movies are back uh that should be a fun episode with all sorts of twists and turns um and appearances from a lot of past guests on the show um so uh that is that that is that is that that is that that is the end of this episode uh emily has returned she has presumably sent the text but the episode is done the text has been sent the episode has been real and as always who cares don't bother me end of transmission <laughs> <laughs>